to order the regular meeting of the Winooski City Council. Um, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Deputy Mayor Hal Holston. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Sure. Next up, we have agenda review. Are there any concerns or questions about the order of items today? Any from audience, from the public? All right, we will move on to public comment. This is a chance for somebody who, members of the public, who want to make a statement about an item that is not on today's agenda to come forward. Um, I would also encourage everyone to sign in. There's a sign-in sheet in the back of the room on the podium if you have not, so that we know who is attending. Public comment? Please uh, introduce yourself. Sure. And My name is Adam Dubroff. I'm the managing partner of the Winooski Hotel Group, owner of Lot 9 at the bottom of the traffic circle. And we've been working with closely with the city to develop a hotel in downtown Winooski since 2014. As a matter of background as to the purpose of me being here today, we received city council approval to develop a Lot 9 hotel in 2016 based on adherence to the master plan and the development agreement that goes with the property. The development agreement and the city's support of a hotel project prior to the purchase was central, was a central part of the Lot 9 acquisition in 2014. It includes provisions for Lot 9 expansion, if a hotel were developed on the site and the city agreed also to pay for transport and disposal costs of any contaminated soils from the site if needed, as well as other mutually beneficial terms. I'm here today because we are close to negotiating a land swap, exchanging lot nine for lot eight with the city. Don't know how much of this you guys know. This is a result of our joint efforts to make a land swap which was an agreed upon change in the strategy between the Winooski Hotel Group, the City of Winooski, and the Downtown Redevelopment Association to identify a site to build a hotel in downtown other than on Lot 9 since September 2017. This was due to a lawsuit against the Winooski Hotel Group and the City on stopping the Lot 9 expansion. Currently, we're at an impasse in our negotiation and need your guidance and support to expedite and finalize the land swap, including the development agreement, which provides consistency in the land swap transaction, which is crucial for the existing and future project debt and equity financing. A Lot 8 hotel project, half a block away from Lot 9, would deliver very similar or the same benefits of the Lot 9 hotel project. It will help stimulate the downtown economy, create approximately 20 to 25 jobs, 100 construction jobs, and increase the Winooski tax base. The Winooski Hotel Group only has requested the same terms that were part of the Lot 9 development agreement to be part of the land swap on Lot 8, no more, no less. The Winooski Hotel Group has financing for the Lot 8 hotel project with VITA, the state of Vermont, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission and the Opportunity Zone funding for the project financing and can transfer our True by Hilton franchise from Lot 9 to Lot 8 based on completion of the land swap and development agreement transfer to Lot 8. We can be available for a council work session, prepare a more formal presentation for the next council meeting, discussion, etc. Whatever you su suggest. We'd like to complete this transaction before year end. Again, and believe all the benefits of the hotel and lot nine will transfer to lot eight. And we are prepared to do whatever it takes to make this happen before Christmas, hopefully. Winooski needs a hotel consistent with the downtown culture. We need your help and support to make this happen. I'm hoping for some suggestions. Well, thank you for coming in. We have all been briefed on this process throughout the negotiations. Our city manager is responsible for negotiations. We know you've been working together. 
And I would urge you to continue to negotiate with her on this land swap. She will keep us apprised and give us opportunities to weigh in. We are unable to discuss this at this time, though, as it's not a, an agenda item. Okay. Uh, but we've been at it in past, and uh, I have some additional materials to give you some more background on this, and uh, would like you to consider some options on, on how we could go forward on this, because if there are the same benefits to doing the land swap on eight as uh, the hotel will deliver on nine. Um, if you would please leave those, she can share those with us afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Thank you, Adam. All right. Uh, we will move on then to our consent agenda. We have for approval our city council minutes from September 16th, payroll warrant for period 9-8-19 to 9-21-19 and warrant ending 10-2-19 and subsequent to payout warrant July and August. We have an adjustment to the city engineer job description and the UPWP PCP agreement, uh, phosphorus control plan agreement. Any questions about the consent agenda? Any questions from the public? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. Uh, city update is next. Great, thank you. Um, so a couple things tonight. One, just a reminder that the mayor and I are hosting a commission orientation tomorrow night here in this uh, room at 6 p.m. Um, all are welcome, and as council liaisons, we hope you will consider joining us as well. Um, while this orientation is specifically targeted for commissioners who have recently been appointed, um, it is a general overview on serving on a board or commission, so encourage anyone who's interested in serving to come and uh, participate in our orientation. I um, want to give you a few uh, airport updates. Um, so since our last meeting, the noise exposure map that the airport has drafted has been published on the btvsound.com website. And just as a reminder, that website, btvsound.com, is the website that the airport maintains for all, um, all airport noise documentation, history, schedules, plans, etc. So the noise exposure map is there. Um, as is the latest draft of the noise compatibility program. Uh, Councillor Duncan and I participated in a meeting on September 19th at the airport on that NCP proposal. Uh, I think it was a very good meeting. I, Jim may uh, share more about it. But just as an update to the public, um, the next hearing on that final grant proposal will be October 24th at the airport. Um, many of the com comments that we heard from our community have been integrated into that document, so I think it's a um, pretty good reflection of what we've been asking for. And then the noise um, mitigation committee will reconvene in December to start working on the actual implementation of that grant. So we're going to meet in advance of actually the award of that funds, those funds with the airport to start planning our implementation plan with them. So there's a couple of updates there. Um, wanted to share that the pool committee is scheduled to meet on Thursday, October 17th at 6. Um, the purpose of that meeting is the Community Services Commission is going to, or the Community Services Department is going to be giving an update just on regular pool construction, but also as we approach building the FY21 budget with um, an operations plan, we want their, in, their, them to weigh in on hours of operation, fees, programming, etc. Just want to make sure we're getting as much feedback as that on that as possible as we build that budget. So again, uh, October 17th, 6 o'clock, where is that here? At the OCC. Um, so next Thursday, October 17th, 6 o'clock at the OCC for um, people to weigh in on pool operations for next summer. I um, want to give you a quick update on development review board. So the environmental court has sent back one of the permit appeals um, from the Environmental Court back to the DRB. The DRB will be holding an appeal hearing on November 5th on that main and mansion project. Um, we, um, as you know, since the last council meeting, the RFP for the redevelopment of Lot 7D closed. Uh, we received four responses to that RFP and had, per the uh, RFP timeline, had interviews scheduled today with all of the respondents. 
want to thank, sincerely thank the mayor and Amy for participating in those interviews as the mayor and um, administrative liaison and liaison to downtown Winooski. We thought their voices at the table would be uh, very useful. Uh, we heard some great um, proposals and we think there is a path forward for 7D in that group, which more to come on that, but I want to give you that quick update. And then fun things going on in the city. Uh, first, thank you to everyone who came out this weekend to paint the mural under the bridge, especially Merla, I know you were there. Um, it was a great event. There's great coverage on CAX um, and really beautifying, uh, uh, interesting place of our city. So thank you all who came out for that. Um, and just a reminder that there's another day on October 12th for mural painting if folks want to um, participate in that. And again, that's under the Winooski Bridge um, right at the bottom of the rotary. Um, on October 16th, Wednesday, we're, um, we will be going to pick the pumpkins for the pumpkin festival. Uh, so we're looking for a few more volunteers for that. Ideally with trucks and trailers, if people are interested, contact <coughs> Olivia um, Miller through the website or call City Hall for her contact information. Um, pumpkin carving, uh, you know, we're trying to carve a thousand pumpkins for um, Festival of Pumpkins, so pumpkin carving will be October 19th uh, from 9 to 5 at the center, Senior Center, and then until 9, uh, or starting at 9 until we finish on the following Sunday as well. So come and carve pumpkins with us. Uh, the Fire Department and Public Works will also be um, providing a food for that event as well. And then, of course, the Pumpkin Festival is October 25th and 26th in the Rotary um, with the Saturday evening five to eight, the community services Halloween party for our youngest neighbors. Those are all the fun things coming up for our next council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have council reports. Can I start with you, Hal? Sure. Um, I met recently with Nicole Mace and Julie Halver, and we were talking about the structure of the equity council. Um, we were unanimous in, in terms of it being a model that would provide um, expertise um, to various city entities um, and engage them around um, issues of equity. Um, it was also discussed to really um, adopt your proposal, Mayor Lott, um, to have a real clear focus on, on the first um, year of, of the council, um, specifically the budget process, the weigh in on that, and when we have our annual um, city uh, council retreat. Um, we also felt it'd be great to um, explore applicants for the, the new council through the, um, the equity dialogue group that had met for several weeks and, and provided this idea. So that's, that's where we are at this point with the council construction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so on September 19th, I attended the airport commission meeting, um, which happened to be the same day that the F-35s arrived. Uh, there was a concerted gathering of people who opposed to the basing who were there to speak during public comment, um, raising similar concerns that we've heard here around safety issues, uh, damage to hearing and health impacts for children. Um, there were some pretty specific requests made at that meeting, uh, including a second environmental impact statement or assessment, uh, more information on expected afterburner use and the need to warn travelers at the airport of potential exposure to noise. Uh, so quite a long public comment period. Um, after that, there was a pretty short operational period discussing the expansion of taxiways and terminal um, arrange rearrangements that are happening. Also just wanted to note the airport says it's being conservative in case of a recession, uh, reducing operational uh, revenue. Um, so a lot of their construction and um, operations forecasting is uh, on a cautious note. And there is still work on a hotel. Um, pretty excellent notes on the commission meeting. Uh, definitely interesting to hear how uh, content is discussed there. Uh, I sat around for an hour and then joined the TAC meeting with Jesse. Uh, and I would only say that um, many of the requests that we made as council relating to how funding will be prioritized, the stuff that will happen at a later date when they develop the planning and policy documents, and not specifically the noise compatibility program. So it's just a need to kind of keep on that as it comes up. Um, so that's going to happen at a future date. And just want to add that um, I feel very lucky that I got to go and watch Jesse do her thing and be a great advocate for our city and our residents. So thank you so much for the work that you do there because um, I was pretty blown away with how on it you are. So thank you. Um, not surprised, just delightfully blown away. Uh, I'm, 
926, uh, Councillor Colston and I uh, met with residents of the senior housing facility at 83 Barlow um, to highlight some of the major issues that we're going to be addressing over the next year, uh, such as mean street revitalization, noise mitigation for the airport, all resident voting, and financial planning. Uh, we got a number of great questions about some of these policy level issues, but then also some operational pieces that we followed up with. Uh, some of the input that came in was around continued parking with redevelopment. Um, if we can provide warning of when F-35s will be flying and a clarification, some, some good questions around all citizen voting that uh, kind of highlighted some of our needs for clarification around what is being proposed and what's not being proposed. Uh, finally, and then I'll stop, on um, this afternoon, uh, Councillor Myers and I uh, went to 65 Barlow, another Minuski Housing Authority property, and met with a resident there, kind of a similar vein, talking about some of the priority issues that are going to be coming up in front of Council and uh, just gathering some more input. Uh, we're happy to have that opportunity as well. Thank you. Um, I also have several updates to share. Uh, first, excellent, uh, two excellent community meals. The International Peace Day meal put on at the Senior Center via St. Stephen's and the Winooski Peace Initiative. Very well attended. Um, and then also the O'Brien Community Center event that North End Studios put on as kind of a opening ceremonies. Um, also very well attended, both exciting community events. I was able to attend a presentation at the Senior Center with the New American Nepali group that attends there on Fridays, put on by AgeWell Vermont and uh, Technology for Tomorrow, where they are assisting, both of those organizations are assisting um, that group with getting more familiar with tech and building skills there. Um, had a world of, in the world of Winooski episode featuring the presentation that we saw previously on the um, diverging diamond inter interchange at exit 16, as well as the East Allen presentation that we're going to see tonight. So that is out there recorded for easy access for folks who want to check it out. Um, had the ribbon cutting at Casavant Overlook, which is the uh, new building on East Allen Street with mixed income housing in place. So that was really exciting um, being able to see that those units are open to the public and already fairly well rented out. Um, and that we have that, those new affordable houses, affordable housing units in our community. I also attended the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance meeting. Um, we are gonna see a presentation from them at a future date on the efforts that are happening in Chittenden County and in Winooski to prevent homelessness. And Jesse and I had some meetings with the new principal at the school and the teachers of the Culture and Community Capstone class to talk about how we can support students in their learning and tie it to things that are actually happening in the, in the community. So we will continue to move forward on that. All right. <laughs> Um, on September 30th, downtown Winooski hosted uh, a small focus group of local businesses and talked to them about some of their unique challenges that they're having and how the organization can better serve them in the future. Uh, some of the biggest takeaways that the businesses shared is a feeling that uh, they needed more foot traffic coming into their businesses and just more people coming into Winooski in general. Downtown Winooski is also actively recruiting board members and specifically looking for members from the business community. So if anyone is interested in um, learning more about that or potentially joining the board, there's going to be an informational meeting on October 22nd, and you can visit downtownwinooski.org to learn more about that. And finally, Downtown Winooski is also um, co-hosting the Festival of Pumpkins with the city. And in the past, folks have asked how they can support the um, festival and especially the pumpkins. So downtown Winooski is hosting an Adopt a Pumpkin this year, um, which is $5 per pumpkin or more if you would like to donate more to the organization. And you can find out more about that at downtownwinooski.org slash Halloween. That is all that I have. And I have nothing to report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Moving into our regular items, our first agenda is an event permit for the Pumpkin Festival. <laughs> Welcome Heather Carrington and Ray Coffey. Hello. 
hello, we've been talking about this pumpkin festival all night and now we need to permit it. Um, so, uh, staff has received an event permit application for the annual festival of pumpkins. Um, for the past few years, the festival has been held in Rotary Park. The display of approximately 1,000 jack-o'-lanterns lit in the park draws hundreds of community members and visitors to our downtown, so there's some of the foot traffic we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, this year, the event is scheduled for Friday, October 25th through Sunday, October 27th from dusk until candles burn out, and this is the first year that the event will be sponsored and organized by the city in partnership with downtown Winooski, so staff recommends approval of the permit, and because the event is co-sponsored by the city, staff also recommends waiving the $200 Rotary Park use fee. And I brought Ray to give any to answer any questions about how we're doing with the pumpkins so far. I'm also going to beg you all to come carve <laughs> roughly 25 to 50 pumpkins each. <laughs> how is it taking over from the work of the season's greetings? Crew? If, if it's not obvious, I am no Sally Tipson. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, so good. I think uh, Meredith from downtown has been awesome to work with so far. I think this adopted pumpkin piece is really cool. Uh, interesting way to get some people engaged early and in a different way. Uh, the farmer has been great to work with, so I've been on the phone with her quite a bit recently about the whens and the wheres. Um, but yeah, we're ready to roll. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm hoping, hoping we can get everything carved on Saturday. That's my optimistic hope, but we'll see. I have a feeling we'll be back Sunday to do it. If we need our shoulders. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you hold yeah. up, we should be good. They don't have to good. look good, right? They just have to No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, definitely by the end of Sunday, there's some questionable techniques. <laughs> but yeah, all good. Are there any questions, concerns from council? Any questions from the public? Corey. What, uh, Corey Mack, resident on Wood North Street. Um, what, uh, what do you do with all the innards of the pumpkins? Oh. Great question. So in the past, we have taken those to a local pig farmer, actually. Um, we have not as yet been able to get said pig farmer on the phone, <laughs> but we are either going to get in, in uh, connection with him or work to compost those. So we'll get those into a responsible waste stream channel. Great, thank but, you. Yeah, no problem. Any others? All right, so then I would entertain a motion to approve the event permit for the Pumpkin Festival and waive the Rotary Park fee. So, so second. Motion by Amy, second by Mike. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks. Um, we next up have some Municipal Infrastructure Commission appoint appointments for approval. <laughs> John Rasher will join us. So we, we have some new applicants for the municipal infrastructure. Um, and I do say we, we really have some exceptional folks that, that came forward for the uh, commission. So we're really excited to bring them on. Um, we are um, looking to appoint or reappoint our three existing members. So Laura, uh, Corey, and Chris. Corey's here tonight. Um, those folks have uh, agreed to go for another two year term, which is great. And then our new members, uh, Jason Williams, um, we're requesting, um, which Jason's here tonight. Uh, Jason, uh, we're, we're looking to have him uh, come in for a one-year term. Uh, Timmer uh, Sutsik, um, two-year term on the regular commission board. And then we have two alternates as well to kind of to fill out our commission. So Jerry Thornton and Peter Wernsdorfer. Awesome. I assume that Jerry and Timmer and Peter are not here. Correct. Okay. Um, did Jason or Corey want to say anything? We all <laughs> saw your information <laughs> in the back. We, uh, as a group, kind of looked over their applications a couple uh, at the last meeting. Um, nothing. Uh, they were all really qualified. I think we have five people and four open slots, two um, active and two. Um, non-voting uh, members. Uh, we wish we could have had all five. Hopefully we can uh, you know, engage everybody that comes uh, in any way that they want. So um, I think that the selection committee had a, a tough choice choosing four out of those five. And you know, I think that they did a good job doing that. So. Awesome, glad to hear it. Um, I also, you know, reading these applications was impressed and thought this is gonna be a good group. Um, are there any questions or concerns from council? 
any from the public? All right, so I would entertain a motion to approve all four appointments to the Municipal Infrastructure Commission, Jerry Thornton, Timur Tsuksu, Peter Warnsdorfer, and Jason Williams. So moved. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Amy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. Can I, can I just for the record ask you to also approve the yes. current, thank you. Can we also approve the current members of uh, reappointments? So, second. <laughs> Motion by Jim, second by Mike. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. Um, along that lines, we have one appointment for the Planning Commission for an alternate seat. Please join us, Eric. I don't know, Eric, John set, set a high bar for I, you. I know, that's why I was, <laughs> I was ready. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm here tonight to request appointment of Sarah Van Rijkevorsel. Is that right, Sarah? Yes. <laughs> Been working on that all day. Uh, to position of the alternate on the Planning Commission. Uh, Sarah has been uh, attending our meetings regularly for the past probably four or five months, I would say, uh, just as a, as a citizen and has been engaged with the, with the Planning Commission. Uh, over the past several months, we've also We've had some of our membership change over due to people uh, leaving the city, most likely, uh, for, for the most part. So Sarah has, uh, has agreed to volunteer as a member, as an alternate member on the Planning Commission and, and help us fill out our, our membership. We still have one alternate position available, so if anybody else is interested, but um, we're requesting that, uh, we, that you all appoint Sarah to that position tonight. Um, I was also excited to have Sarah apply because she has been very engaged and has been a great addition to the discussion. Did you want to say anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or concerns from council? Any questions or concerns from the public? All right, so I would entertain a motion to approve Sarah Van Rijkevorsel as alternate on the Planning Commission. So moved. Second. Motion by House, second by Mike. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, we have a discussion item. We have Charlie Baker here from Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission to give us annual presentation. I'm Charlie Baker, And Mike O'Brien, our Winooski representative to CCRPC. Charlie told me not to say anything, so I'm just going to be quiet. Good luck. If, if that's possible. Yeah. You're doing a good start. That would have been starting. <laughs> I didn't ask. He, he offered that, which I, I had the same kind of reaction you did. Um, so thank you very much for the time on your agenda. Um, the uh, report I think you got in your packet, I'm just going to review that real quick. And this is really, from my view, a customer service call with the city. Uh, we're an organization that is made up of the municipalities of Chittenden County. The first page gives you a little bit of background about that, uh, who, who makes up our board. Uh, in addition to the municipalities, um, how we're funded, which is a small percent from municipal dues, and then we leverage federal and state funds um, into our budget and into the county. Uh, at the bottom, you also see your representatives. Thank you for all of them, and, and Mike, who is now our chair of our board. So uh, thank you for uh, volunteering him to help us. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we gotta keep him busy. Um, and uh, on the second uh, and third pages are specific things that we worked on in this uh, city of Winooski over uh, in FY19. So this is a report uh, for FY19, uh, including the, the uh, Main Street Bridge, uh, looking at impact fees, the East Allen scoping study that you're going to hear about in a couple of minutes, um, some brownfields work. I, I'm not going to read every single one of these. Uh, the municipal roads, general permit assistance, traffic counts, um, other general assistance you know, to your planning department and, and other sections. So happy to answer any questions or take any feedback on, on any of that work. But um, I think the, our, I know our staff's been working very well with your staff, so I appreciate all that professionalism here. Um, and then on the bottom of the third, uh, going over to the fourth page, are a couple projects that are in our transportation improvement program or also the state's capital uh, program, um, including some uh, pavement repair, 
on the class one roads that you have um, and some crosswalk enhancements. And then going a little bit further is what you have in our work program in FY20, which is the phosphorus control plan that you just approved um, and uh, following up on some inspection and inventory of your stormwater system. Um, so again, I'm happy to take any questions, feedback on any of that. Um, and then the last two or three pages are things that we're doing without regard to any specific municipality, but just more generally in our region, uh, focused on our regional plan, uh, ECOS plan implementation, uh, legislative order, building homes together. Again, I'm not gonna read every single one of these, uh, but energy planning, emergency management, some public health issues, other transportation issues. Um, uh, regional dispatch and we started up the 89 study uh, just recently so that'll be a little bit uh, bigger topic over the coming fiscal year or two um, happy to answer any questions or take any feedback on any of those topics if I could just underline a couple of points I think it's um, especially for the new counselors I want to really thank Mike for his leadership as I came on board as well the UPWP programs which you see through grant um, application requests every year is something the city hadn't fully utilized um, in the past and Mike really advocated for us to put in some applications for that funding. So again, this is a way that we're trying to bring in funding to support scoping and other project development work in the city that's not born on the backs of our local taxpayers. Um, and Charlie and his team, which you'll hear later on tonight, have been huge partners in getting a lot of thought done, a lot of community process done in our community. So it's a huge resource and they are located here in Winooski. It was great. Down West Canal Street, so <laughs> glad to glad to be here. So it's been over ten years since we moved our office here. So, and I don't know, Mike, if you want to add anything, I mean, you, you told me not to talk. No, no. <laughs> Again, I did not do that. <laughs> Christine's looking at me. Don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I to echo Jesse's. I mean, uh, with John uh, now being involved on the TAC, I believe it is TAC, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Uh, Eric on the pack. Excuse me. I, I, one of the things we talk about is all these uh, uh, <laughs> acronyms that we have, just pack and tack. And so, planning advisory committee is the pack. Um, Eric's on that, and John on the uh, transportation advisory committee, which is the technical aspect of, of the, uh, the organization. Uh, and John Cho on a couple of committees. Uh, so, and Amy, or I'm sorry, Abby is the alternate um, trying to get her involved too so who's on the planning commission she's on the planning commission and i should thank you for appointing sarah to the planning commission and i'll again echo eric's thing we need one more alternate so if anyone's out there that wants to join a fun loving group <laughs> <laughs> um i i would just say that ccrpc for you know folks who don't know what you do obviously there's an extensive list here but having this resource of somebody who is thinking regionally, who is working across towns and stakeholder groups, and also bringing expertise in when we don't have the staff capability is just tremendously useful. Um, also pretty impressed by the statistic in here. It's an 11 to one return on our dues investment, so can't be mad at that. <laughs> That's why it's there. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions from council? Anything you want to hear more about? I would say this, if you do have any questions, feel free to call me or Charlie, mm -hmm. you know, anytime. Yep. I did want to ask if you were going to do another legislative forum um, this year. Yep. Um, actually, I think the email to save the date is going out tomorrow morning. So oh, excellent. Good, good guess. Um, yeah, so I think uh, early part of December, um, yeah, we're getting that set up right now. Um, and also, um, the other thing that we're doing that we haven't traditionally done is uh, uh, communicating with all the legislators uh, in the county uh, to let them know that like these annual reports uh, that are obviously all like, like Hal representing a municipality also uh, in the legislature. So we want to uh, make sure they're aware of what we're doing with you all. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think that communication is going out tomorrow morning also. I also had a note. I saw something in here about elderly and disabled transit service mm. and wanted to hear more about that discussion. Um, so the short version um, 
is I think about a year and a half ago or so, uh, you know, we had some conversation about uh, could could we do more? Uh, could we look at that system? Um, so we've contracted with United Way um, and uh, their staff that has been working in this area uh, in the neighbor rights program you may have heard of. Um, and so uh, we had we work with United Way and uh, Green Mountain Transit to really work with all the partners in the elderly and disabled service area uh, to, to just kind of look at that service. Um, being Chittenden County, we don't do it the same way as they do it in the rest of the state, um, for better or worse, and I'm not sure, I think some better, some worse. Um, so in most of the rest of the state, they have one consistent program for the entire county or, or region. Um, here we really have kind of a patchwork um, based on which communities kind of joined the E&D partnership maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> and so. Uh, it may be something we follow up on uh, just to kind of say, should we relook at how that system is structured? Um, and uh, there's a few dynamics there. I think GMT is going to be uh, issuing an RFP for that service, which right now SSTA provides. Um, that, you know, is nothing uh, overly magic. I think that they do a great job at, at providing that service. They may do it again, but um, every so often GMT puts it out to bid. Um, and then the other part of the conversation is much more municipally based, um, which is uh, some municipalities are partners and contribute some match to that service. Others are not. Um, and, and I can't remember uh, Winiski's situation in that. I don't know if you contribute, if you have a line item in your budget to contribute back to that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, maybe a conversation that we want to have at some point about uh, making it easier on the residents of Chittenden County, particularly as a as they may move from town to town to have a consistent level of service, which is just, and again, no judgment, but it's just not consistent level of service from town to town right now. So that's a, a little brief background. And, you know, I think we've been more focused on the information pieces that are available to riders and trying to get some consistent communication um, that's more useful, but it still has a table attached that says, you know, well, if you live in Colchester, you get X. If you live in Essex, you get Y. <laughs> it's a little complicated uh, for a resident to understand. Thanks. It's nice to hear that that, while still early stage, that that's a conversation that's happening. Yeah, and there's, um, there's some opportunity, I think, to improve that. Any other questions? Great. Thank Any you very much. Thank you. Questions from the public oh, first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Mike. Yes, On that note, our next item is the East, a presentation of the East Allen Scoping Study. Um, so we are going to see some alternatives that are being proposed for the future of our East Allen Corridor. This is a chance for public feedback. So folks who are here now is an opportunity to you know, share what your thoughts are on this um, for the project team to hear before they finalize alternative selection. So where is being set up? I just wanted to kind of give you the intro. Can you sit down? So, Can you sit down so you're at the mic, please? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> So this project, as Charlie mentioned, is part of the FY19 UPWP solicitation. Um, so when, when we put this application in, we really had sort of three major questions in mind for this corridor. Uh, one, you know, how do we sort of improve the East Allen Hoods Crossing uh, intersection? It's, it's kind of a, it's, a not, it's not an ideal geometry for that, that intersection that comes in. And then you also have um, the issue with the railroad crossing that goes through there. So we really wanted to explore what are some feasible options to, to make that intersection you know, easier to navigate and um, what are the costs associated with that. Uh, two, how do we kind of better align this corridor with our new form-based code um, regulations and align with the transportation master plan? So, you know, we, we looked hard sort of behind the property lines on what those building massings should look like, but um, 
we need to we need to also spend some time looking at the right of way and determine what are the best sort of uses for each um, I mean, mode of transportation with that new form-based code regulation. And then three, you know, what are some feasible sort of interim options that we can do that are sort of less expensive than a, a full build-out? So, you know, as you know, we've got some pretty large uh, capital projects moving forward right now. Uh, we don't have a lot of debt capacity to take on another major project. So what are some sort of short-term things that we can do to um, maybe implement some of the vision of, of this corridor study? So that was our, you know, that was our initial um, application submission request and you know more questions came up as we went through this study but um, you know this is sort of the I guess the light at the end of the tunnel the tail end of this scoping study uh, where you know now we're presenting to the council and we're gonna um, present sort of the advisory committee um, recommendations and they'll, they'll be an ask sort of at the end of this slide to give either your feedback or endorse some alternatives um, so that's kind of where we're at. This, this project did start in 2018, November 2018, so it's been a, a pretty long process to get here and a lot of really great community feedback um, to get to where we're at. But, and just yes. to add a few more sentences, it, while this project started in 2018, I think it's important to remember that this planning work started significantly before that during the development of the form base code, the acknowledgement that some of the um, road the right of way would need to change and then through the transportation master plan in 2017 as well so this is kind of a high level you know we started with the zoning high level transportation master plan then into more scoping specifics about what could actually be done on the, on the road so you are picking that up at this point in that multi-year conversation great yeah and so that i just want to introduce uh dave saldino we have erica also with bhp jason from ccrpc and Eleni from CCRPC, um, who've been great throughout this whole process. And um, no, I think it, it's, been a, it's, it's been a great scoping study, just hearing all the community feedback and, and getting you know, their thoughts and looking at concerns throughout the corridor. So with that, I'll kick it off to Dave to, okay. to go through it. And the timing has been great with all of the activity happening on East Allen Street during the course of the study. So I, I think it kind of energized the discussions around what, what the future holds for the corridor. So I think it's the, the timing worked out um, nicely there. Let me see if uh, this should advance, right? Yes, okay. Um, so we're gonna try to keep it fairly high level. Um, happy to pause or stop uh, to, to answer questions or to go into detail. Um, the idea here really, just a, a brief overview of the project itself. Uh, uh, John did a great job summarizing the why and the what. Uh, touch on the purpose and needs, why we're doing the study, what, what we're looking to resolve. Uh, really, the, be the meat, meat of the presentation is around the corridor plan elements, and we'll show the, the different um, uh, alternatives that we looked at, and then end with next steps. All right, so this is the project team. Um, noted everyone on the left so far. On the right-hand side was the project advisory committee. Um, got some good uh, kind of diverse uh, viewpoints from, from different members from both public and private sector. Uh, and so we met with that project advisory committee three times through the course of the study. Um, this is a project study area. It's um, maybe a little hard to see the context, but the, the circulator is down here, just off the left-hand side. So East Allen Street, Route 15, runs across here, Spring Street and the railroad tracks. Uh, so we go all the way from the circulator all the way up to Roland Court, so just past the interchange exit 15, um, and looking at all, at the kind of transportation corridor along this along this route. Uh, I won't read this um, in detail, but the idea really was to identify was to carry forward the recommendations that came out of the Gateway Study and the, and the, the transportation master plan to really look at accommodating all modes along the corridor. Uh, looking at this as a gateway into Winooski, so looking at aesthetics and, and how it's perceived for those, those folks who are coming into town, uh, improving mobility and, and safety along the corridor. Obviously, as John alluded to, the intersection of Spring Street has, um, not only is it a de designated high crash location, but it, it feels unsafe pretty much any mode that you're in if you're trying to walk through or drive through the intersection. Um, and then looking at ways to, to maximize gateway development and redevelopment opportunities. Um, the needs fall pretty much in line. Um, so again, addressing pedestrian and bicycle accommodations, balancing accommodations for all modes, 
Uh, you can see safety there, better, better accommodations for transit service along the route. Um, this is a pretty high, high frequented route, um, but there's not a lot of actual accommodations at those stops for, for transit users. Uh, and then addressing some of the operational issues, both uh, at either end, both at exit 15 and at the circulator, as well as at, at Spring Street. Um, as John noted, we, we kicked this off back in November, um, and uh, uh, there was three advisory committee meetings through the course of the project, um, as well as uh, this being the, the third public meeting. So we had uh, initial pub, uh, local concerns public meeting in February, um, and then an alternatives presentation public meeting in June. Uh, the local concerns actually fell on, on um, uh, Valentine's Day. We got a really good turnout. We had, <laughs> we had trace paper out, and people were willing to come out and, and uh, dedicate the time, which was great. Um, so that feedback was, was captured, and we've, um, we've pulled together an actual report um, that's in draft form until uh, we see where we land tonight. Uh, and then the final scoping report will get issued once we, once we hear where we land, and we can wrap that up in the final report. <clears throat> so um, while we're looking at the entire corridor, improvements along the corridor, it, it became pretty clear that the, the interest and, and kind of the, the issues were concentrated at certain locations. And so we broke out these focus areas. Um, the ones in yellow are ones where we looked at multiple alternatives, um, and we'll touch on some of those. And then the, the two locations in red were a single alternative, and we'll show that, that uh, as well. <coughs> so starting with the first fo focus area, so we're just we're down by the circulator. This is Barlow and, and Cascade Way. Um, some of the issues, this is the existing conditions here. Um, you can see uh, we do have one crosswalk uh, across uh, East Allen Street here, but a missing crosswalk on this leg. Um, we've got brick, brick sidewalks on both sides. Uh, you can see on this side, though, we've got trees and lights uh, within the sidewalk, so that minimizes the effective width of the, of the sidewalks in those locations. Uh, the no left turn in or out um, does limit some turning movements, particularly those who would like to get to the parking garage, obviously, uh, can, cannot do that legally now. Uh, we heard from a, a number of residents and others who are, who are intentionally kind of bypassing this to get across to go up uh, Barlow Street. Um, we've got this wide expanse of pavement here and ex essentially ex an acceleration lane coming out of Cascade that in an urban environment you don't necessarily need a, that much pavement or an acceleration lane to, um, to move. It, it also represents a break in the bike lanes. So we've got a striped bike lane back here and then it picks up off this screen. So it's an opportunity to reclaim some of that space for bike lane uh, for, for bicycle usage. So um, we looked at three different alternatives at the intersection. <coughs> um, and, and as John alluded to, we really wanted to focus on some short-term, mostly striping improvements as, a, as an initial um, way to get some, some improvements, uh, and then a longer-term alternative. Uh, so in this case, the short-term alternative is this merge lane removal. So again, again addressing this lane here, repurposing that, that asphalt. Uh, and then the, the two um, uh, kind of um, more intensive alternatives looked at getting rid of the triangle splitter island, turning this into a full four-way intersection. Uh, the main difference between these two were whether both alternatives have moving the southerly curb up to be able to get a green belt in this space. Uh, the second alternative, which was the alternative that was recommended by the advisory committee, was also, also involved moving in the up, uh, northern, northerly curb line. Uh, and I'll show that on a, on a graphic. Um, lots of information here, and I'm um, happy to go into detail, but these um, will come back. This, the same matrix appears for each of the, each of the locations. Um, the different alternatives are shown here as the columns. Uh, total cost estimate, probably the one that you would be interested in most, is on, on the top row here. Uh, so this, the, the merge lane removal, or essentially restriping, um, is a fairly low cost item, and um, there is a VTrans paving project coming through in 2022 that could essentially make that um, almost non-existent. It could just be wrapped into the striping plans that go along with that paving project. Uh, the alternatives two and three are more expensive because it involves moving curb, moving some catch basins and drainage, um, potentially re repaving the, um, uh, the roadway, uh, what's, what's remaining of the roadway. Um, so this is what the, the short-term recommendation, and again, this is what the um, advisory committee had recommended to move forward with for short-term improvements. Uh, so essentially just striping out, hatching out that, um, the merge lane, well, essentially turning that acceleration lane uh, into uh, roughly um, uh, eight foot bike, or uh, sorry, six foot uh, hatched area and then a bike lane, striping up, uh, getting the full bike lane all the way through this section. 
uh, there's opportunity to put some um, planters or some something else uh, out in the street during obviously during the warmer months to um, utilize that space so it's not just striped uh, striped hatching. Uh, this also carries bike lanes through with the bike uh, crossings uh, at uh, Barlow and Cascade Way. Um, so mostly striping here, um, and then uh, um, additional additional treatments or, or or planters within the in the roadway if so desired. Um, Can I ask a question? Please, yeah. Uh, what was the discussion? Why would you start with striping? Like, why wouldn't you just put parking in the first place there if that's a potential pathway? We had quite a bit of conversation about that. Um, the, the concern was that, um, or I guess the prevailing, the, the, the sentiment that won the day was the long-term solution that was recommended um, doesn't have parking on the south side. And so the concern about providing parking for, depending on when this moves forward, five years, it's hard once you, once you provide it to then take it away. Um, it's certainly, you know, the space is there. Um, it would also preclude, it would make it difficult to fit the bike lane in there as well if you were to go to full parking, uh, on street parking there. I see, it's not the same depth. Uh, it, it, uh, the, com the combination of both the bike lane and the hatching would be enough for one for a parking lane. Okay. Is there any concern about traffic congestion by coming out of Cascade Way onto East Allen? Instead of having that first striped, should there be more of an on ramp to get onto East Allen? Um, you know, if, if if we were just looking at pure traffic flow, mm -hmm. sure. But you know, most intersections in the city are you know are, are more like Barlow Street with a with more of a ninety degree turn, and so we felt that this radius here accommodated some higher speeds. But um, essentially, in an urban environment, you don't necessarily want people kind of gunning it around the corner at, at high speeds. I see. Okay. Um, it also gets the angle such that, you know, right now, sometimes people, the way that they're angled, they almost have to turn 180 yeah, degrees see. to see behind them. Yep. This orients them so it's, it's a little bit easier to see to your left as you're seeing, looking at oncoming traffic. Um, so this is the long-term alternative, and, and um, as I mentioned before, can't quite see the existing, the, the existing curb line is back here at the edge of the existing sidewalk, so moving that out six feet for a new green belt, um, which could be planted with trees, moving that out of the existing uh, sidewalks, uh, along with the lighting as well. Uh, this gets cross, this missing crosswalk gets uh, filled in here. Um, we remove the um, splitter island here um, to, to create more of a four-way four intersection, traditional four-way intersection, um, and then also moving the curb line in six feet on the southerly side to get green belts on both sides. And again, that, that conversation came up um, it was almost a one-for-one -one discussion, green, green belt, so trees and other green things versus parking. Um, in this case, uh, the recommendation was to go, go forward with this uh, enhanced landscaping and green um, kind of at the arrival as you're, just as you're heading into, into downtown to have that um, uh, kind of that buffer from the sidewalks and from the, the cars in that section. I got a question for you, the Cascade Way intersection, mm -hmm. is there enough visibility by the side building to see oncoming traffic? I mean, that looks pretty far back behind the building right there. It does, yeah, the, this corner here. We yeah. did look at the, at the, the, you know, if you're at the stop bar, it would be, it is a difficult sight lines, but, you know, the, the rule is that you've got to stop at the stop bar, and then you can pull ahead in, uh, you know, to be able to see uh, before entering the traffic stream. So at, the, at this point, you know, you, you most likely would not be able to see fully to the left, um, but you can see at the crosswalk if there's pedestrians, and you can pull forward, and you'll have, you have clear view to, to your left once you get up forward. Does this, oh, sorry, no, John. Go ahead. Does this plan, or did you talk about having um, a flashing pedestrian crosswalk? Because I've walked my dog in that area a lot, and I've seen people stop at that crosswalk, kind of mm. to no avail, like people just drive through anyway. Mm -hmm. And I just was curious if there was um, any discussion about a flashing light or something that would draw more attention to the crosswalks. Mm -hmm. We did talk about it. Um, I think where we landed with this, and I'll, I'll look to others too, but th this is close enough into the urban center where there was enough other things going on. Um, the flashing beacons tend to lose their um, function or their, you know, they don't stand out as much if you have them at every intersection. Mm -hmm. And so kind of selectively placing them at places where there's higher speeds and potential for, you know, for, for more nasty accidents if, if the one were to occur. So there is one planned uh, further east on here. Okay. Um, that's not to say one couldn't go in here, um, and we did talk about it a little bit, but we, we felt that the speeds here, the, the crossing distance was, was short enough, the speeds are slow enough that this would work just as is with the striped crosswalk. 
Yeah, and to add on to that too, there there was quite a bit of discussion on that particular crosswalk because I think a lot of people had the same issue. I've had that issue too going across there. Mm -hmm. um, VTrans also recommended sort of a raised crosswalk to just give a little more you know, notification to drivers so that that could be something to look at. Um, and then to follow up on the on-street parking, so just to give you a little bit, um, little bit more information on that. So part of the on-street parking discussion, um, one, you know, the parking garage is, is in close proximity. Uh, two, we don't really know what those, you know, with that, those developments that are currently residential, what that might look like. So we are leaving the door open. So if, if there's a development that comes in, there's opportunity to do maybe a curb cut and add some parking spaces depending on what the development looks like, you know. So if you have a, a quick stop coffee place or something where you want to provide some on-street parking, you know, you, you could potentially do that down the road as well. Be, let me get, let's get back to Amy's question. Jim and I are at a meeting today, and that was one of the concerns about the residents on Barlow Street at the senior living places. Is that intersection right there? They, one side of traffic will stop when they see somebody, but the other side doesn't. So mm -hmm. most people at that corner do not cross until both sides stop, which is smart. Mm -hmm. But I think by hearing from the residents, I think a flasher, if that would be implemented into this kind of plan, would be good for, for those folks going down to the marketplace down, downtown. I would say though, with the configuration change and the narrowing of the crosswalk and slowing of traffic, the experience could change on its own, mm -hmm. just because the, the feeling is gonna be different than what it is currently. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out, because you have a lot of seniors and just disabled people living in that section of town, mm -hmm. and they, they tend to walk down that way to get to the resources downtown. And that was one of the questions the resident brought up today. So, food for thought. Mm -hmm. You said there was a nearby flasher that might essentially conflict for attention that's too close, further upstream. Like, where was that? I know we're going to get to that, but like, how? what part of the project was that going to be at? Uh, so up at Manso. At Manso. Yeah. So not not so close it would conflict, but just that, you know, the re repetition of seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. How do other folks, I mean, does that feel like a really important location to have the flashing beacons? Well, I think Christine makes a good point that with the bump out and the additional crosswalk delineation, it's sort of hard to tell, I guess, until that's built, what yeah. the experience will be like, so. Mm -hmm. It is for you know for sure just from a psychological standpoint as you're driving into the city you know as you get to the v oops sorry the VSAC building you know you you kind of have um, it, there's a lot going on you've mm -hmm. got this big building that all of a sudden appears um, you've got you know lots of traffic there's pedestrians and so there is a lot going on right at that location that as a driver who's new to this area is kind of taking in at that at that point um, there's shading there too which I mean you can see in the photo as well that may you know, deter. Uh, some visibility there from, from the driver. So mm -hmm. it is, it's a questionable crosswalk. Especially with all the seniors living in that one area, they must use that intersection quite a bit. In my, I, I would guess, I don't, I don't have a fact to, to back that, but all of them are located right in that section of the town mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and resources downtown. I know some of them, some will walk to, I mean, most of them do. Yeah. I know sometimes, I know um, Woodstock and Middlebury just stand out that have gone kind of old fashioned and, and they just use flags with a little um, PVC pipe at either side on the signs and so you just grab the flag and you know it makes you more visible as you cross and you stick it in the pipe on the other side and then you can use it on the way back. Um, I know Middlebury has it up on Route 7 you know, as you go through, go through the village, a pretty high traffic volume. Um, no, that is interesting because it catches your eye. Because I right. know the one at the Rotary, when people see a flash and all traffic stops now, oh, yeah. unless someone's not paying attention. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's four lanes. And it's four lanes, but like they, they do and they work. Yeah. But that's an interesting point too. It'd be less expensive for the city too. Way less, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Quick trip to Home Depot and you're, you're all set. Yeah. <laughs> um, Some of the kids don't take them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now moving on, the next one is a Casavant natural area. This was one that, um, just a single alternative. So just highlighting some of the things uh, adjacent to the parking. We've got uh, vehicle scale lighting. Um, signage is a little bit hard to see for folks who aren't familiar. Uh, not much in the way of trailhead accommodations and the parking is, is a little bit undefined. Um, 
So this is just a sketch, um, uh, you know, a thought of a way to better delineate the, the parking from kind of a, an arrival area. Um, also better uh, breaking, apart, breaking apart the parking area and um, kind of segregating this area out from the adjacent parking for the um, adjacent home. Um, opportunities for all kinds of things here, so an information <coughs> kiosk, a map, uh, some benches, some solid, uh, stone seating areas, um, and then some landscaping to buffer, again, from the, the, the street side as well. Let's see. So next focus area is the Spring Street intersection. Um, and so we, we looked at primarily the intersection itself, but as you can see, the, one of the alternatives uh, expanded out a little bit to the west here, and we'll, we'll show that uh, as the second alternative. Um, here's, here's a look at the intersection looking down the hill. Um, striping has changed a little bit since the, since the photo was taken, but um, you know, again, we've got the, kind of the, the high cobra head vehicle scale lighting. Uh, no left turn movement coming out of Winooski, not that there's a huge demand, but that left turn lane is not there. Obviously an at-grade rail crossing. Um, the right-of-way, so the, the publicly owned land is 66 feet. It's a four-rod right-of-way, which falls just about at the, at the back sides of the sidewalks, which means there's not a lot of room, really no room to expand beyond kind of what's here um, without uh, impacting private properties. Um, there's an eight, in this location, eight-foot multi-use path. Um, got no, no crosswalk across this section of, of East Allen Street. Um, uh, this merge lane or the an additional lane for folks coming off of East Spring Street. Uh, a narrow five-foot sidewalk on this side with no, no grass belt. Uh, and then this pedestrian crossing that is marked, but um, a number of folks uh, get concerned crossing here as there's some high speeds coming off of, off of East Allen onto Spring Street. So putting that all together, we looked at a number of different alternatives. Um, uh, the, the two that, that kind of um, uh, filtered to the top uh, based on the uh, advisory committee's input were this signalized op option. So essentially putting a signal in at the existing, using existing geometry um, with a few modifications. So for example, adding in a left turn lane with the signal now, you have that ability to make that left turn. Uh, adding in the crosswalk with uh, pedestrian actuation, so um, pedestrian crossing uh, signals for each of the, each of the approaches. Um, uh, carrying through the a bike lane, which we'll see on the next slide, uh, comes through here, um, through the intersection coming uh, west to east, uh, and then the signal itself. And we kept uh, the configuration of Spring Street and Hood Street as is, as shown there. Um, this does have uh, 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 addresses traffic congestion. So we're, the the existing conditions, the backups are in the level of service D to E uh, range, which you know is noticeable. Uh, those who have driven through it, you see the, the queuing and delays on Spring Street. Because of the difficulties pulling out uh, onto, onto East Allen, the signal um, basically gets it back to level service A. So it's almost uh, free flow, less than 10 seconds of average delay for each of the approaches. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of straightforward signalized option. This one was a little bit outside the box and, and um, kept moving forward. You know, I think we, we threw it out as a, wouldn't that be a crazy idea if you did this? And then it seemed to make sense as we looked into it a little bit more. Um, so this idea, so here's the existing intersection down here. Uh, this takes East Spring Street and peels it off to the west of East, of East Allen, um, comes uh, across the railroad tracks at a new uh, grade crossing, uh, past, this is Waffs Deli here, uh, out into a T intersection out on East Spring Street, uh, East Allen Street. Um, we're showing here with Mont Street parking. This does have bike lanes and one sidewalk uh, along this length. Uh, basically the same configuration on East Allen, so a through lane in each direction and turn left and right turn lanes. Um, and then uh, some real opportunities to do something. So this is the existing East Spring Street that can be either converted back to grass or this could become uh, potentially public, public space to do something, um, maybe a small park or some other uh, you know, public, public use. Um, and then we're showing uh, um, uh, Hood Street going as a cul-de-sac here. As a turnaround, so this would be one way. You know, the only way to exit would be to the north. Um, there's some caveats here, some some major um, uh, hurdles that would have to be crossed. The the two biggest, probably the the, the two biggest one one being uh, New England Central Rail uh, does not dole out new at grade crossings very easily, and so there's just to, just to get in the door, um, there's currently it's about ten thousand dollars to just submit a request for a new grade crossing, um, at which point they can just say no. Um, and so there's obviously some nuanced discussions and some opportunities to look at um, maybe there's another grade crossing that can be um, 
you know, scaled back, uh, or there's some other um, ways to pitch that we're moving some of the conflicts at this grade crossing, so this one, by allowing this one, it smooths out traffic flow here, so it's not quite as complex uh, as the trains are crossing through this intersection. So that's, that's one, if, if uh, New England Central were to say no, that basically would kill this option, because there would be no, way, no other way to get across the railroad tracks. Um, and then the other one, this, this does have um, some private property Im impacts, and so there would have to be some pretty, pretty lengthy discussions with the well, property Well, I was just going to ask you, the parking lot lofts, that that stays a, a market, you're taking all the parking out. Plus, if memory serves me right, did, is that one lot now, or is that still considered two lots where Lost Deli is? Because there used to be a house there. Oh, really? And they filled it in, and Loft bought it to make the parking lot. So that I don't know if that's considered two lots still, or one. So if we're going to get rid of that, that might have a tax impact too. You're saying the house was on in between. There was a house in between those two properties, and when Loft moved his deli there, the property burnt down. I think it was just a big sinkhole, and he took it over. And the reason I know is because. My former boss shop used to be right next door, um, and he wanted to buy it, but Waff ended up buying it before him, mm -hmm. and he made it into his parking lot. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's considered one property now, or if it's still considered two. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's zoned. I bet you. I, I bet you it's zoned for two. Mm -hmm. So that's another something to think about too when you're talking about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have larger concerns. I think unless this is significantly cheaper or significantly better for traffic, it's a non-starter. The railroad, first of all, is a large challenge. Um, the right-of-way acquisitions involved here are too much, and I don't see how there is substantially more benefit to this than signalizing what's already there, what we saw in the last Well, it's going to be a little more... I think the residents would go... I don't think the residents would like this one at all. I just didn't want to say that. <laughs> the residents, the senior. I don't senior. think the residents would care for this one because it'd be too much of a change for most of the people that have been living here compared to what they've been used to. And making Hood Street a dead end street would just, I think. That came up during, we had several folks who lived on Hood Street yeah. and, and none of them had any issue with it. I mean, it does. It, 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 it's an inconvenience for them, you know, because they can't get right out onto, onto East Allen, but it mm -hmm. also creates less traffic on their street, so, it, you know, it's kind of a, a positive and a negative. Right, right, right. But um, I'm with Christine, I think that this is pretty from, gigantic. From a purely operational standpoint, in terms of how traffic flows, they're both about the same. They both, um, you know, they're both the same number of lanes feeding in. One, one's at a skewed angle, one's perpendicular, but since they're both signalized, they both operate fairly. Um, similarly, um, this does, you know, if there is some way to negotiate, a, you know, a purchase of this piece of property here, um, that does open up opportunities for the city. And not that you're looking for, you know, untaxed, more untaxed parcels, but that would be you know, one of the benefits here. It does also create, there's a missing, there's a gap in the pedestrian network, um, uh, kind of coming up the hill on, on East Springs. So there's no way to walk, you know, um, legally, I guess, in this section. So this would allow for a, a sidewalk or a shared use path. Um, but, um, I mean, I think geometry-wise, like, from a purely sort of, you know, planning standpoint, it does untangle that intersection by pulling that street off, but, you know, that's from a blank slate trying to, like, mm -hmm. you know, do a model city sort of planning exercise. To the uh, first alternative, is it possible to still get a sidewalk on East Spring and make that connection? I mean, if the roadway width is wide enough there, right? So could you, even if you did the first alternative, could you still add that or connect those sidewalks? Uh, up here? Yeah. It's, tough, it's, it's um, pretty steep grade mm -hmm. on, on that side of Spring Street, mm -hmm. which is the side that you'd want to be on to tie mm -hmm. to the sidewalk up the hill. Um, so that's, I think that's why there is no sidewalk here, because it's really tough uh, with Spring Street being there. We did look at, one of the alternatives was, was looking at making Spring Street one way only. And we tried. We looked at both directions. You know, if you made it, because then you could use the other lane for you know um, some kind of pedestrian use. Uh, but it operationally it just complicated things, and then detour routes. Other other routes, people would use Barlow more, and you know, so that that, that didn't play out well. We also looked at a roundabout here as another alternative, um, which uh, processed traffic fairly well. But um, it's a tight it's a tight fit here. You know, the roundabout kind of extends out generally here, and you've got a, a steep drop off here, so you have to be. Retaining wall, it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly with the roundabout. 
Also double rail crossings at the railroad. Yes, that too. The opposed to. Yes, yes, that's exactly. complicated. Is there any concern that a signalized intersection right there would further back up traffic getting in and out of Winooski? Um, you know, depending on how the signal, the way we looked at it with the signal, we, we optimized, you know, we, we, we looked at how the signal was flowing and we didn't see extensive backups. I think, I think the summary on the slide may just have, yeah, this just has the overall delay. But overall, on average, during the busiest, during rush hour in 2039, so we, we projected out the 20 years, looked at traffic volumes, um, we, we saw it going from an F to level of service B, so on average 16 seconds. I don't remember, and I don't know, Eric, if you remember any of the queuing on East Allen Street itself, but it, it was fairly minimal from what I, what I recall. So the way that uh, mm -hmm. the, the advisory committee had recommended uh, to you to, to consider this was to uh, tentatively advance this, this alternative to uh, basically going, um, testing out the rail, railroad to see if this is an option uh, and, then, and then having conversations with the property owners. If those were, were if we hit some uh, uh, red flags there, then move back to advancing the, the signalized option. Um, but it sounds like you may have other thoughts on that. I mean, it's not up to me, obviously, but if you go back to that, your alternative comparison slide, it's twice the price, it's slightly better improvement, it's way more effort, way more impact. I, I personally don't see the value in spending more time on that approach, mm -hmm. but I would definitely want to hear from others if they disagree. Uh, unless they sold that land to a private developer that, that they're discussing, instead of making it a park. That could ease, but I'd like, I don't know, I don't, I think number one would be the one I'd want to go with, if it was up to us. I mean, I think right now, though, the price difference is 10 grand, so it's 1% of the cheap cost to find out whether or not Alternative 2 even has legs. Like, that's the first piece, is asking for that grade crossing, and if they say no, like, that solidifies it. So I'm wondering if it's still worth spending 10 grand to find out if there is improvements in bicycle and vehicle safety that are better under alternative two. And so the delay is one thing, level of service is one thing, but if there's better safety for pedestrians, if there's reestablishing or establishing new connections right now that don't exist with some of our residential neighborhoods to East Allen, then that could be an improvement worth paying 10 grand to find out if we could do it or not. I'm not saying that I'm in favor of alternative two, but it might be worth, like you said, tentatively looking at that and investing that small amount of money to decide what we could do. So, but it's not just that, it's also the time it's gonna to take to talk to the housing authority about their appetite yes. for property, um, what's the word I want? Acquisitions. Yeah, and, yeah, and I don't gather that that's something that they have been particularly interested in in the past as well. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing to note too that that 2.4 number does not include any property acquisition values. So, like, if we had to purchase the WAFs parcel or um, any sort of permanent easement work, that's really just design construction. So, it's actually a little bit higher. Sure. But she's trying to sell that property now anyway. But if if that happened, I, I don't see that commercial space being there anymore because there's no parking. If someone else bought that commercial space and put a sandwich shop there, where are you going to park? So you'd probably be killing that and making that into a residence, which I'm not even sure if it's zoned for residence right there. So it's, there's some things to think about too on that, on this focused area number two. I should um, also point out that we welcome Community questions here too. A question about the bike lane going east, mm -hmm. eastbound. eastbound. Where where does it end? Because it doesn't continue out throughout the East Allen. Um, so you're saying the bike lane that's out there currently? Yeah. So it looks like it ends around Barlow, maybe. Uh, no, it goes to um, Abenaki Way and then and then converts into a, the, the multi-use path, so the paved path that's on okay. the south side, uh, which goes runs all the way through the interchange. Okay. Um, it's it's kind of hard to see sometimes because it, it kind of blends in with people's front yards and you know goes through the the, the uh, gas station driveway, so it's kind of hard to tell that it's there. Okay. 
Um, should I press on? We have a last slide that kind of summarizes the recommendations. Okay. All right, uh, almost there. So focus area three, this is the uh, three and four lane section just east of uh, East Spring Street. Um, had some fun with, uh, with PowerPoint graphics here because the, the photo that we had has, uh, is, has changed in the last couple weeks. So they're best to, to represent what's out there today. Um, so uh, obviously a new building is in place here. Uh, here's that, that path uh, that goes along the west side here. Uh, this is Manso, just to orient you. Spring Street is down at the bottom of the, of the intersection. Uh, again, the right, right of way on both sides are just at the back of sidewalks. Uh, right now we've got three lanes, two in the eastbound direction, one in the westbound direction. Uh, some on street parking here, uh, new crosswalk that's going in with a, with a raised median. Um, so uh, this is just a depiction of what is out there today or, or just about complete uh, out there today. Um, the two primary alternatives we looked at for this section were um, kind of short term, basically not moving curbs, looking at primarily just striping and then um, a more, uh, more advanced um, alternative that, that involves uh, shifting curbs to get some additional landscape buffers. <coughs> um, so this is the short-term alternative. This is probably hard to see, and I think, did you? We have an okay. Okay. This is page two, which should be in there. And then the second one will be page four. Sort of, this have something that's a little bit easier to read. Um, Essentially, this carries, uh, this adds in a, a two-way center left turn lane. Um, so right now, if you, if you imagine you've got two eastbound lanes, one westbound lane, uh, this converts this one of those, the, the other eastbound lane. Um, so, you, so at the end of the restriping, you've got one lane in each direction, a center left turn lane, um, and then um, uh, bike, lanes, a bike lane on the westbound side, on the north side of the, intersect, of the, uh, of the corridor. Um, crosswalk staying here at Manso. Um, Maintaining this merge, this, this uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but the idea, this, this, uh, this assumes, the way that this is configured, assumes that there's no signal at Spring Street as of the restriping of this corridor. And so the idea here is to keep an addition, a lane for somebody to turn into. So they're turning off East Spring, turning left onto East Allen. Um, they've got you know a couple hundred feet here of uh, merge lane, but then they have to get down into a single lane before this crosswalk. So that's how we accommodated that neck down to, to a single lane coming out of town. Um, in the other direction, it's kind of already been addressed, but the idea as you're coming from uh, Colchester, Essex, you come under the interstate, rather than having two lanes come through uh, and then neck down to one, which is what happens today, uh, converting that center lane into a, a left turn. So you've got two left turns going on to the interstate, which is really where uh, heavy flows occur, particularly in the morning. Uh, and then just carrying a single lane through so you don't have that lane drop as you, as you come in this direction. So that gets you the, the single lane in each direction. Um, shifting the, the bus stops uh, a little bit closer to where some of the primary action is uh, um, on either side of the, this crosswalk. Um, formalizing this median here um, with raised, raised curving and landscaping and carrying that curving around the front of the, of the crosswalk to enhance the safety of that crossing. Um, so this is the this is the, the short term alternative. This is mostly striping, as I mentioned. Um, a lot of this could be addressed as part of the paving project in, in 2022. Uh, the longer term alternative, um, again hard to see. Apologize for that, but but uh, this this incorporates moving the curb lines on both sides to get the green belt uh, uh, on on both sides. This has a seven foot landscape buffer on on both sides. Uh, still maintaining the center two-way left turn lane and single lane in each direction. Uh, this one does pop out to two lanes as you approach the on-ramp to I-89, uh, which allows for a pull-off for, for buses on, on the eastbound direction. Um, and, uh, and the remainder stays fairly same. This, this, the cost here is really all in moving curbs, moving drainage, and uh, to accommodate that additional landscape buffer. So what is happening with the bus stop on the other side? Stop traffic? Yes, yeah. Um, we did, we thought that there might be an opportunity. You know, this, again, this is kind of scoping level. The next, for any of these, the next level is to get into more detailed design mm -hmm. and survey and so forth. There may be an opportunity to, on this side of the intersection, be, um, not start this island quite as soon, and so keep a little bit of, a little bit of width here. So that's closer to where the existing transit stop is now, so that there is 
so that that would maintain some room for the bus to stop and allow traffic to get past it. And that's a, that's a good point for council and for the public is that these studies are here to inform future work. This isn't saying like this is what we are going to do. We have a plan for this. Right. There are many many next steps and years before any of this would be enacted. But this conversation does say put this on the books as like this is what we start from later, and so it does you know the input does matter. Yeah, it's a starting point. Question back there. Um, oh, and could you state your name, please? My name is Judy Lance. I live in Rome and have for 30 years or more. How many vehicles travel east and west in this section every day? Uh, it's 18 to 19,000 per day. Okay. Then the second part of my question is, how is have, would having one travel lane in each direction affect congestion, traffic congestion? Um, from the best that we can tell, so we've done quite a bit of traffic modeling with these, these volumes. Typical rule of thumb for two lane roadway is about 20,000 cars per day. So we're, we are under that, and then, again, that's just a rule of thumb. Uh, so we're under that threshold. Uh, there aren't really, other than the, a, a potential bus stopping, there aren't really things that would be stopping vehicles as they're moving through. Um, so there's certainly enough capacity. This, this, uh, the volume here is less than what's out on Colchester Avenue, uh, or roughly the same, and so that, that went through a similar conversion from four to three lanes. Um, I won't say it's congestion free, but it, traffic certainly moves during peak hours. It's really, it's really around uh, intersections and signals where you see the capacity constraints with, with a single lane. Uh, since we don't have signals, any signals in this section where it goes down to three lanes, um, we didn't see any issues with that. Um, you have the center turn lane, so anybody who's stopping to turn left can get out of traffic. You know, if you wanted to turn into one of a home or something, you're out of traffic and, and, and cars can pass. So the turning lane is the third lane. That's right, okay. yeah. All right. Okay. Any thought about the on ramp right there with congestions? I know between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning, it's almost at a deadlock. And if you're going to start bringing in more people coming down from Colchester onto the interstate, it's usually, between those times, it's usually deadlock during the week, Monday through Friday. You're saying on the main line? On I'm on the main line, but now you have one lane coming on, and then you have two lanes coming on to their on-ramp. If you're going to allow more traffic to get on the interstate that's already deadlocked, What's that going to do to the single lane traffic trying to get up to Colchester, Essex? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I guess just to clarify, this doesn't necessarily, we've got two lanes here, doesn't necessarily mean twice as many cars will go. What will likely happen is that this will get less green time because you can have t two cars go for every second that passes mm -hmm. instead of just a single car. So you, you get some more efficiency, so you can give that green time back to people coming out of town. Um, so it'll still be roughly the same number of cars getting onto the interstate. They'll have to jockey for position and merge as they as they move up the ramp. Uh, but it'll, it won't be that, probably not that many more vehicles, but it makes the whole intersection operate more efficiently because you can, you know, of your, of your time that you can give green to, you're giving less to these left turns and giving more to this direction, so you have less backups in that direction. Okay. okay. And um, the interchange, um, covered most of it uh, in the previous slide. Uh, this basically carries um, through, with some striping, carries uh, the, the multi-use path through the intersection to Rolling Court with a future connection to the Vermont 15 path once the alignment gets um, better, uh, better um, understood east of Rolling Court. Uh, and we talked about converting to two left turn lanes and then the merge lane on the, on the access. So, um, that kind of takes us through the, the entire corridor. Um, what you have in front of you are kind of all of these pieces put together on the corridor to show both what a short term and a long term alternative would look like. Um, that's not to say that those are the right answers and you know this is really up, up for discussion or, or um, to see where you guys want to land. Just to summarize where the uh, committee recommended. So at Barlow and Cascade, Cascade, it was the short term striping in that merge in the uh, acceleration lane and then the more expensive of the two long-term alternatives that moves both curb lines uh, in. So that was the recommendation, focus area one. As we talked about, focus area two was the tentative exploration of uh, alternative two, the realignment, and if not, then moving to the signalized uh, option. Uh, and then focus area three, again, striping that short-term, ideally captured as part of the V-Trans paving project, and then the long-term alternative, looking at moving both curb lines and um, getting some additional landscaping in there. 
So that's that's essentially the the uh, the recommendations, and um, I guess I'll leave it to you to discuss or decide. Can I first just check if there's any more public comment? Start back here. Yeah, Nate. Yes. Um, I was really hoping to see more on street parking. Um, I was on the advisory committee, went to two of the three meetings. Um, uh, we talked a lot about trying to, to get more on-street parking, or at least some, it's a, it's a tough balance. Um, but I'm wondering if, if some more light can be shed on that decision and you know, how we might be able to look at that to see if we can bring in some on-street parking on that stretch. Yeah, and I guess I can speak to that. So, <clears throat> as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, we did show sort of the bumped out, like ideal curved option where we have added green space, but I think our intention was as developments come in, you know, for example, like 268 development where there's a need for some on-street parking to potentially cut that curb in to provide the, the needed on-street parking. So I think, you know, with planning, we would look at it sort of a case-by-case -case development um, to see what, what the need is for any potential on-street parking. I think that all makes sense, but this, this sort of memorializes kind of the approach to push away from that. So I just think it's important um, as we move forward, if it's possible, to get some of that language in there. Um, so I think it's really important um, to create this walkable urban downtown to continue with the, the fabric of on-street parking, or at least some on-street parking in this stretch. So, you know, I would ask that we put a little more thought back into that. I know it, it seemed like we were moving in that direction from the first two meetings. Um, you know, really trying to slow traffic down this corridor. We have a lot of, you know, property along this corridor. Um, I cross the street along this corridor a lot, and uh, anything we can do to, to calm traffic, I think, is really important. So, um, adding the the on street parking not only does it add value to uh, future retail spaces and things like that, um, but it also calms traffic in a major. So it's really important to me, and hopefully there's a way to, to get that into this report so we, we don't forget about that. But, you know, just along those lines, one comment that came up a couple times was the concern that if, if there is no, no one parking in those parking spaces, then it, it almost works in reverse, that it's excess pavement and people will drive faster. Um, it's hard to say, and I think, a lot, I think it's hard for people um, who don't do this every day to come in and, and try to imagine what the future East Allen is going to look like with buildings and you know mixed uses and I think today people are having a hard time imagining who would park out there. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that was part of the conversation as well. Yeah, and the other and the other big part of that too, um, David, is we're bringing in these residential developments. We'd like to have retail commercial uh, components to them, but we can't support that without some on street parking. Um, so. Having that availability helps to steer the development from, from day one towards something that's more urban, something that, that fits a vibrant downtown a little better. So it, it, you can't really wait, wait too long on that. Um, but, but I completely understand the challenges of getting everything through this corridor. Uh, that would be the challenge. Are we going to take away from something to add parking, or can we get it all in there? It's, it's always a balance, so, you know, there's, unfortunately, there's never enough room to fit sort of the, you know, the streetscape zone, which is usually six to seven feet for the, the nice tree plantings and the bike lane and, you know, the necessary sort of drive lanes, which are, you know, 12 foot for the, the center lane, 11 foot for each drive lane, and try to, like, get that all in a 66 foot corridor, so it's, it, it's always a give and take. <coughs> It's, it's usually bike lane and parking. So. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up though, because if you're going to retail, no one's going to walk uphill to go there in the middle of winter, I can tell you that. And we're having that problem on the Rotary, everyone else. On the Rotary, where there's no street parking, on that curve going towards McKees, there's, it's a hard place to rent to businesses because there's no back doors and there's no front, front off street parking right there. And I think that needs to be, that's a good idea. I'm glad you brought that up. And I, and I will say with the, the new form-based code, there is a requirement to have sort of that parking in the back. I know that's not ideal for the quick trips in and out, um, but that the intention is that a lot of that parking will be in the back, and that's why all the buildings are sort of pushed up to the, the right of way. So um, again, I think we, we would have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis.
basis for on-street parking. Um, instead of just showing it sort of carte blanche and then removing all the, the green space. Um. Uh, Corey, you had something? Yes, I did. Um, thank you. Uh, I didn't know what the comment focus was at the beginning, so I actually had comments starting at the very beginning. So um, uh, just going to that first focus area when we were talking about uh, uh, the, um, the short term and the long term recommendations there. Um, and it also kind of uh, works into this parking discussion. I think that it is possible to maintain parking there and also have some of this green space that we're also talking about that kind of breaks up that. Um, and that can be done with like uh, bump, bump outs, cur curb extensions in those locations um, to kind of give you the opportunity for planting, but also, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you don't want to park right up to the intersection or anything. So you need to have some amount of, um, uh, you know, like a, like a bump out or, or something there. Uh, there was also uh, some planters shown. We could use planters on like the corners and let people park in between them or something. Uh, but I think that parking is really important for um, you know, first floor retail. And also it's revenue for the city so that like each parking space, you know, gets two bucks an hour, which adds up over the course of a year. So I think that those, those are um, good things to have. Um, so, so yeah, so in this, this situation here, like I see five potential parking spaces there. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure the widths there. You know, you don't want a bike lane right next to a parking aisle. Um, so if there's room for that kind of thing, I would really um, suggest that we, we include that kind of uh, development. Um, and in the longer term, moving those curbs, I don't really see the benefit of moving the curbs. Uh, you know, the, you have that green space along the curb line, which is good for like snow storage or something. Um, but I think that overall, I'd, I'd rather see parking there and have that be an option for, for people to, to do. And I think it's not worth the expense of moving all those curves. Um, so what was the other ones here? Um, uh, I didn't have much of a comment on the um, CASA van, um, although there's a, a note about how the, uh, the new sign, the, the, the existing sign is uh, like kind of hidden, and then like this, a new sign proposed that's kind of parallel to the roadway. It's like, I don't know how that'd be any less hidden, but it, it's probably good to have some sort of thought put into that parking lot. Um, for the uh, hood crossing intersection, um, I, I, I'm not so quick to write off the roundabout. Um, it, it does seem like a lot to uh, you know, consider uh, having a, a railroad go right through it, um, but I think that it does have some potential to it. Um, the signalized, you know, teeing up the signalized intersection, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of drawn pretty simple. I mean, you, you got to do it simply in a, a scoping study like this, but uh, the way that the two pedestrian crossings on the uh, um, northeast corner there kind of, like, come into the railroad, that's going to be a little bit of an issue. Um, how, uh, uh, not the, the previous one. Um, um, thank you. Um, so like how, uh, how the two pedestrian crossings come right at that uh, there. Um, I, I see that that, and like how the curb kind of curls into the railroad, we're going to be impacting the railroad there. It's not like they don't have a choice in this one. So, uh, you know, I think that a roundabout, you know, it is challenging, but, you know, they're proven to be safer, uh, far more, um, uh, more capacity. Um, it would be challenging for sure um, with a roundabout here, but I, I don't, I'm much more of a proponent of looking at this versus a roundabout versus that uh, whole uh, um, new roadway alignment. Like that to me is like a, that's a, a right of way nightmare, a, a railroad nightmare, a bunch of other, other things. Not kind of roundabout through you know, railroad walk in the park. But um, uh, the other thing that kind of like disappeared here is that um, eastbound uphill bike lane, how you brought that up. Um, it, uh, it does kind of, I guess, go into that path. Uh, so I, like, I guess that's what, what happens here, but we have the downhill uh, westbound bike lane that's kind of shown through here. Um, and that kind of brings me into the next area when we're looking at um, the uh, um, short-term concept for this uh, area. We have that downhill bike lane drawn in, but in the existing condition, we, um, so the down, okay. It gets complicated, and it, and it really comes down to, um, I, I don't really understand how we got from the four lane condition that we had two months ago to what we have now. I think that we kind of lost an opportunity here um, where uh, we had like studied this whole um, 
Uh, we're, we're doing it in the middle of the study, looking at this corridor, and in the middle of that study, there's a decision made to, to almost irreversibly change the corridor. And I don't really understand how we got from looking at this corridor to doing something without having this discussion first. Because um, right now, there's um, basically with, with the way we put in that curved island with a crosswalk, there's no downhill bike lane, there's no east, um, westbound bike lane anymore without moving curbs, which we're all trying to do this without um, uh, spending as much, we're spending as little money as possible using that um, 2022 paving to our advantage. Um, so I, you know, I'm a little disappointed that we're here where we are now. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, this no road diode, no curb relocation, it was a really um, good alternative, but it's kind of lost a lot of that appeal with, um, with how it kind of got developed in the interim. Um, so, uh, there's that, and then also on the. Um, Can I just um, just one clip or one point? Um, this this what's what's shown here does take into account all of the um, you know basic everything that's out there today um, is accommodated here. So this does you know take into account this has those raised the raised island here. Um, this does have you know right now it's two lanes heading in this direction, but it does accommodate um, uh, the the geometry. That this the striping could work here. The the um, those raised islands, those may need to be that that would be the only that would be the only thing that might um, uh, need to move. These islands would probably have to move uh, to the north to be in the in the in the right lane as you're heading. You know, is that right? I'm just trying to think. No, no, no. I guess those would not have to move because right? we have two lanes. No, I'm sorry. So this is this is <laughs> this is the second eastbound lane in the center right here today. Yeah, you drop that eastbound lane right. right there. All right. So this might be a good opportunity, to actually, John, if you want to talk about the recent changes that were made. Sure. So we um, we met with the developer. Uh, it was probably May of last year when they came in with 268 East Allen, um, and. You know, one of the, the big concerns as, as, this, as this project was sort of in design phase was, you know, the pedestrian safety aspect of sort of going first, being one of the first big buildings on the East Allen Corridor with the, the high speed traffic that's, that's currently going through there. Um, you know, we, we reviewed some preliminary uh, plans for, for potentially changing these lanes permanent, but we, um, you know, we, we were cautious with it. We didn't want to move ahead without kind of seeing what that looked like, um, without, you know, going through, well, for them, they ended up taking out a lane for construction activities, which was sort of a good pilot to see what this kind of lane configuration would look like uh, before ultimately we, we would approve anything. Because we had concerns about what traffic queuing would do with reducing a lane, um, you know, what kind of, what that crossing would look like for pedestrians. Um, and concurrently, we were going through the scoping study, so we wanted to kind of get some data from that before we actually made a decision. So, you know, with, with VHB's work, we were able to confirm, you know, okay, modeling-wise, uh, sort of one lane in each direction was adequate for the traffic volume capacity. So that gave us sort of level of comfort for um, reducing to one lane. But ultimately, it, it came down to how do we provide some pedestrian safety um, in, in the short term. And, you know, the developer came back to us a year later after that sort of construction phase work was done, and, and we monitored it throughout that period to see what traffic flows did. We worked with public safety to kind of get their input. Um, we also put it in front of we put this plan in front of the advisory committee um, to kind of get some feedback from VTrans. Um, you know, there was discussion on where the crosswalk was located and potentially moving that. Um, there was even some discussion about going further um, in, re in doing the necking it down to two lanes with the two center turn lanes. Um, we didn't want to go that aggressive <laughs> uh, for this round, but we did want to provide some pedestrian safety given we're adding residents on the south side and you know there's a new development on the north side of East Allen. So, you know, what's what's something we can do quickly to, to slow traffic and, and help those crossings. And you know, luckily we worked with a you know a developer that was willing to kind of 
basically build that out, and, and they were the ones that funded the money to, um, to build out this infrastructure to provide sort of pedestrian safety there. So that's kind of where we were coming from. You know, we didn't want to miss the opportunity where a developer was willing to do this work, provide some pedestrian safety, um, and you know, and it's it's not a cost to the city. And we were able to pull out some elements from the scoping study to to kind of do that. Um, and I will say there, you know, a lot of this was when we were looking at this. We also had a pedestrian fatality further up to quarter, which you know. We looked at how can we how can we improve the safety for pedestrians. Um, that's that's ultimately what it came down to. Hmm. Any more questions from the public? So, when was it decided that there were going to be parking spaces in front of the new the Casa Van Dorp building? Is that what the name of it is? The new building that's yeah, that's, that's the when, were, when was it decided there would be permanent parking spaces there? So that occurred um, after the construction staging work. So that was roughly around, okay. I think it was May 2019 okay. that was approved. And will there be commercial uses on the ground floor of that building? Or is it all residential? That is all residential. Okay. I have another question that's not right in this section. Up in front of the gas stations in the last few days, there appeared some diagonal yellow cross hatching. I don't understand, in the middle of the road, I don't understand what that means. The unit comes to the union, roughly similar to where we're showing it here. Um, those two lanes coming downhill, is that what you're talking about? Well, it's right in the middle of the road. Right, there's an island there where you are going west where you turn your left signal on to turn into the mobile station, for instance. There's this big section of yellow diagonal cross hatching painted in the middle of the road now. Well, there's now a left turn into the industrial park, right? So I, it may have to do with that de delineation of that left turn. Yeah. Does that sound right? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it means this is... You can, if you're going to be turning left, you can move your car into this yellow hatching, or if you need to stay out of this yellow hatching, I don't know what it means. It's confusing to somebody like me who drives there every day. <laughs> okay, well, I'll never mind. I'll pursue it Is it just road. a closure of lane? Yeah. I, 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 can you go back? It might be showing you the, the existing condition slide there. Uh, no, it's not further out. But yeah, I think it's just sort of a closing the land like Mike had mentioned there. Right. I, I guess my, my concern earlier that kind of brought this up was that like we were in the middle of this scoping process where we were evaluating this corridor as a public, you know, all gathering this, doing this as a community, and then it was changed. Like it was, they, it was parts of this scoping study, you know, which maybe is the right answer, this is the right way to go forward, um, but it was like done overnight, you know, and like I love moving quick, you know, that's, that's awesome. Uh, but I don't know if it was what everybody had in mind. Uh, I mean, like we had discussed at the beginning of this presentation, a very extensive public outreach process, uh, attack and all that, and all that. And I guess it, maybe it was uh, um, confirmed with VTrans, um, and you know there was uh, some outre outreach out outside of the, the public process. But um, all of a sudden, like we're doing PowerPoint drawings on <laughs> to to show a new existing condition. And, uh, so I would say, and Jesse John, correct me if I speak that we did not do a good job of communicating these changes they are also not meant to be long term um, it was addressing a safety concern that came up with these new developments and the fatality for sure and yes that is absolutely and, something to address but so they are meant to be like a short-term fix for that right now and then this would still be on the table for what the future would be of the corridor but i i do agree that we didn't Tell people it was changing. Well, we have we have the developer also footing the bill. So why don't we just have him do what we wanted to as a community three months later or something? I mean, that's that's I feel like a missed opportunity. So, and like I, I think that we should moving forward whenever we make changes to the public roadway, like to this extent, that I think that you know it should be, and, and when we're actively studying it and for, for that part, you know that's something that we need to consider. 
It definitely wasn't a popular decision because if you re read front porch form like I do, there are a lot of people that aren't too keen on the new changes. I haven't heard any positive ones anyway. Um, but that said, the ones that are negative, they're not offering any suggestions, you know, but I agree with Corey, it, it kind of just happened. Well, I think you raised raise a process issue and I think that as my understanding, the city council previously delegated some authority to the city manager to make these kinds of decisions about roadway reconfiguration. So <coughs> that was made. Um, I mean, the process was followed that we, as a council, had outlined. It doesn't mean it was the best communicated, as you alluded to, Mayor. Um, I would hope that the scoping report would include that original. The, the no alternative isn't shown, right? The no action alternative is no longer part of this presentation of leaving the road as it is. So I'd hope that the scoping study still addresses that, so that is shown, and because I think I'm hopeful that re that this configuration actually does lead to a lower likelihood of a person being killed crossing this road, and I think that I feel okay with a mm -hmm. miscommunication if it means that someone's life is endangered. But I would hope that we could still show the value of this change in light of the no true no action alternative in the scoping report, so we can see that and show that to the public as well. And let me make one very important point, is that traffic design, road decisions, crosswalk placements, changes to configuration are the purview of the city manager and staff. They are not the purview of this council because they shouldn't be political decisions. And so that is the proper process that they go through staff. If you know these experts say this is the change we need to make, then they have the authority to make that change. So but again, we <clears throat> could have told people. So just as the person who ultimately made that decision, I think um, absolutely we could always have done a better job communicating this. I guess from our perspective, this is something that we have been talking about since 268 was originally permitted through those uh, public hearings and then what's the number 243 across the street as well. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, we, and just reiterating what John said a few minutes ago, um, we really saw the construction traffic pattern as a year long pilot to test what, what this safety measure would do with the community value that we've heard through the transportation master plan and the form based code zoning to slow down traffic coming through that, that uh, stretch of road to really have it enter a neighborhood to create some more safety opportunities, some more pedestrian crossings. We saw that in practice over the last year through the um, traffic enforcement data and the accident data. We saw that it was making that positive improvement. And actually we did get some positive comments about how traffic calming was working in, that real, in the interim realignment during construction. So when the developer came to us willing to incrementally move towards an improved um, pedestrian orientation, improves, improved neighborhood orientation, we really saw that as an opportunity for the city to move quickly in an incremental way. Personally, I don't think that decision of mine limited or closed off any future decisions we may make as a community about what goes into to that area. But as we've talked about all night, this is scoping that's going to take several years to re-implement. And while we had a solution that was working on this on the street with people used to a traffic realignment, we took the opportunity at no cost to the city to make that change permanent until there was another change the community decided on. So that's why I made my decision. Absolutely, we could have done a better job communicating it. Always lessons learned, but just that's how I made that decision. And uh, Councillor Duncan is right. This is a process question for the council whether you want to reopen that ordinance and reallocate that authority. Yeah, Did just, I, sorry, no, I just saw a hand. Um, just for someone who rides in the fire trucks going through that intersection, um, maybe you're on the right path to um, change that intersection. Um, conversations in the fire trucks just the other morning when we went through there was, wow, what's changed? Um, you know, traffic actually yielded for us as we came off East Spring, and we often use that to get to the interstate in your early morning calls. Um, so um, that hasn't been the experience for many, many years. It's, uh, you know, we get in with two lanes going up the hill and it's a racetrack. Um, you're calming it down and again, traffic's yielded. Um, so that's probably four or five times I've heard that conversation and for those that drive in emergency vehicles through that intersection. Yeah, and I'll, I'll 
just add to Jesse's point too. So this is kind of a unique situation. We don't usually have developers coming in and saying we want to invest to, to do some work in the right way. So as you've probably seen, our typical sort of if you know where city is doing the work, there's a whole outreach piece that goes along with a city project. That's a little more difficult to do, and it's really a developer-driven project. And um, I think. You know, some of that is we don't always know the schedule because it, you know, depends on the contractor and weather. And, um, so I, you know, these kind of situations I think are going to be kind of far and few between versus like our typical, you know, public works type projects. So just added, you know, there. So I think the only other issue raised that we haven't really given guidance on is the on-street parking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked the point about making sure that there's some language in there or some way to say that this can exist. Um, it did surprise me seeing these on-street parking being very important in our main street, uh, you know, what came out of that study and then not seeing it here. I think the point about folks not viewing that corridor as a place in need of it makes sense. Um, I, I personally would be a fan of showing, somehow showing that that is an option. Um, Here's what others' thoughts are. Sorry, first going Yeah, but I guess my biggest concern is we have a shared use path right now, and how does on street parking work with that um, in that upper section of East Allen? And then, uh, and I guess the, if, is, where does the parking go, John, if you had that vision of a, a future cut to break into? what right now would be the green belt pedestrian bike or green belt pedestrian space. Does that mean a road, like a routing of the sidewalk along, like who's providing that rerouting? I guess I'm just curious if it's like a case by case basis and there's actually need in the development for on-street parking. It would be great to have it be only developed as on-street parking on a needs basis because then we don't presuppose the use of every single building along there needing that parking that when we could be making better use of that space some other way. So, does the parking end up on the public right of way? How do you deal with the sidewalk issue? How do you maintain bike and pedestrian continuity? I guess I'm just curious if that's if that seems clear to you because it doesn't to me. Um, that's a big question I had about providing parking in that needs basis. Yeah, it, and it is tough because you, I mean, you can see all the sort of existing curb cuts there. Those lots could all get consolidated and there's only two or three big buildings. But I mean, what I guess I could see is some curb cuts getting consolidated with a, you know, a developer consolidating lots and then you could have some curb cuts bumped in even into, you know, potentially a portion of that brick section, which I think is like eight foot wide right now um, to create sort of that, you know, parking width uh, for, for a car. So, I, I mean, without knowing like what the development plans are, um, it's hard to say where those kind of future on-street parking spaces would be. Um, I mean, what are we going to say to a developer who follows the suit 268 says, I want <coughs> on street parking in front of my building or else I'm not going to build here? Are we going to say, okay, see you later? Or we're we going to take that into consideration. That's why I think the language in this study needs to be there because you just can't have one building with five parking spots and none or 100 feet down the road and have another one. I mean, it's got to have some continuity to it to make it look appealing too. I mean, that's got to be realistic as well. It's good for one contractor, it should be good for another one. And I think that's what we're suggesting is okay. that um, until we we know what the market will bear in these areas that we leave that potential on the street. I think it is a good point that the language of the final report should reflect that potential um, for developers, but I think but I think what we're suggesting is that intention as properties change, as the future growth becomes more evident. That we pro that we proactively work with folks looking to do projects and what those solutions might be. Correct. Yeah, and I mean we can add callouts to the plan showing you know, you know potential on street parking just to make it clear that anyone's looking at sort of these basis and de design scoping studies know that that's something that you know, we have in the back of our minds that needs to be accommodated. Mm -hmm. That's a thought. Yeah. Yeah. Up, um, it's going to take a while to scroll through, but up at the upper upper section, there are seven foot green belts. So in the 
in the future condition, there is an opportunity. You know, ideally, a parking lane would be eight feet wide, but the, but you could probably find an extra foot somewhere. But the, the idea is that you could um, <coughs> you know, take a bank of these. Uh, so this, where are we here? Um, and so so this, this, is, this is the 248 main right here. Um, but if you needed this parking here, here, you know, any of these could, uh, this is a seven foot landscape buffer, so you could, in theory, rather than put that in there at some future point, that could be the, the parking lane. Um, it could be all of those, it could be one block with the rest being bumped out and landscaped. Um, so it, had, it could fit in there at some future date. And I think, to, to John's point, maybe the call outs on the plans just say landscape buffer mm -hmm. or parking to be determined at a future date or something like that. And I would just be worried that this is a kind of degradation by a bunch of cuts of the form-based code vision for a green a cityscape with greenscape. If every option, if the option is like you can opt for parking, or if you don't, then we'll put in the green belt. I would worry that we could see a lot of parking opted for that may not be necessarily needed. But then the result is that we've done a lot of work for gateway zoning that doesn't result in the form that people were voting for or approving in form-based code. So that would be the one. My one concern about making it a blanket, if you want it, you get it, otherwise it's landscaping, that we need to have some sort of, um, there has to be some achievement of the form-based code, too. It's a business case scenario for, it would be related to knowing what development is coming, a business case scenario of like a quick stop situation, like Morning Lake Bakery or somewhere like that. Not every. Yeah, like an opt-out. <coughs> I mean, and this is uh, this is great. We're having this discussion because these are the things we want to pin down, you know, as more developments start coming through. Because these are the questions we're kind of grappling with um, as staff, as is with these developments. Like, what is what are the criteria that is sort of the vision for this corridor? Any final questions? Can I ask one more. Yeah. My new my new question on the north side between. Barlow and and so there's uh, the brick sidewalk with the trees and lights in the brick sidewalk as you pointed out um, which I don't think if we think about accessibility probably is not wheelchair compatible at this point so if we don't extend the curb line we have to choose between sidewalks and or green space or trees basically trees and lights or sidewalk because we can't if we don't expand that north side down and looking at the point that you were making Corey if we don't bump that curve down, we don't have space for both accessible sidewalk and uh, light and uh, basically infrastructure. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you know, technically you have an ADA accessible sidewalk on the south side, but it doesn't mm -hmm. help someone who's trying to get down on the, on the north side. And especially that's the sidewalk adjacent to our senior housing facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Is there any other specific feedback that would be helpful to you tonight? I think we covered my, I guess just if you could, um, on the parking piece, um, are we talking that, that uh, the, the change to the call out, would that apply to this block here between, between uh, Cascade and Abenaki Way and also up the hill? Yeah, um, I think anywhere that has retail, having that option if your commercial space really warrants it. Um, that has retail or could have retail, right? Because some of this could get redeveloped with mm -hmm. retail. Yeah, okay. But I, I, I agree making that distinction about like, every, you, you have to have a business case for mm -hmm. why you need these spaces. So yeah, with that, that addressed. Um, I, I don't know, I didn't touch base with these guys beforehand if we're looking for a formal motion or just kind of a, mm -hmm. you know, just in the notes, kind of nodding heads. And, Endorsement. Yep, just discussion. Yeah. Well, thank you for yes. answering many, many questions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Erica, too, for all the work you did on this. Um, I am going to call a two minute recess and reconvene us at 8.02. All right, I will, it is 8.02, so I will reconvene at city council meeting. We will move to our next item on the regular agenda F. This is discussion of our FY21 budget goal setting session. Great, thank you. 
So um, this is the first hard conversation of your FY21 budget process. Um, Angela has put together this memo for you. So our key questions for you tonight, we are in the midst of building, the departments are in the midst of building their individual budgets um, for submittal to us in the next two weeks. And then Angela and I will work on the citywide budget. We go through what we call a budget Congress process to get to a budget that hopefully meets your goals and moves the city's work forward through November. So as we go into that process, we're really looking for your um, values, your thoughts, your priorities as we build a budget to present to you. So you can kind of get some of that out um, ahead of time. We're not looking for any votes tonight as much as what you're thinking about for uh, these key questions. So your tax rate goals for FY21, uh, what are your priority areas to fund? Um, given that we may need to identify cuts, are there areas of that you would be willing to consider service reductions? Um, and then are there new initiatives or programs you really want to see us include in the budget? Uh, we've given you some history here of the tax rate history over the last couple of years, as well as the voter approval of the budget. Um, Angela's made a note that a 1% tax rate increase this year raises $57,000. Um, so on the next page, you see um, in our memo uh, some initial assumptions we're making about the budget, about the cost of living. Um, we're anticipating uh, what grandless growth might look like, how health insurance rate increases may impact our bottom line, um, and some other small changes. So the upshot of those bullets is that with just cost of living and health care changes, assuming a grandless growth that we had this year, which will raise an additional fifty-two or uh, forty-two thousand dollars, we're looking at a about a half a percent increase in our tax rate with nothing else changing. So mm -hmm. no paving increase, no pavement increases, no electrical cost increases, no community liaisons, et cetera. That's just baseline to keep our doors open, doing what we're currently doing. Um, then we've also started to bullet out for you some things we're thinking about, um, some things we've heard from you and heard from community conversations. So obviously we intend to open this pool we've just built. Uh, so we're building out the operations cost for that. Uh, we are considering, um, because we don't have access to our JAG funding this year, our Department of Justice JAG funding, building that into our operations budget. Uh, we've heard you talk about the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and potentially interest in, in seed funding that. Um, we mentioned at the um, priority setting session in the spring the potential need for a new finance um, system given what the state decides on the tax department education grant list system, which that announcement should be coming out hopefully in the next month or so. Um, the chiefs and I are working on the Trinity County Public Safety Regional Dispatch um, proposal. Um, we've talked about equity work and how we want to consider that moving forward. Um, and of course, later in your agenda is the scholarship policy and if we want to seed fund that. Uh, we've also heard from you a real emphasis for FY21 on improving some sidewalks through the capital plan. Um, and then just another item for consideration, although with no general fund impact, is the potential of Lot 7D being redeveloping and starting to fund that through the parking fund in FY21. Again, no tax rate impact for that. So those are our, our initial thoughts, uh, but really tonight we are here to hear what your priorities, your thoughts are, what you want us to be thinking about as we try and um, give you initially a budget that is most responsive to your values. So last year, we, and Hal, please help me out here, we, I think, kind of discussed a range of what we felt comfortable with, a top and a, and a low end of what a tax rate increase would be. Mm -hmm. um, a top obviously being like this is all we can stomach to pre present to voters, and I think a bottom to recognize like this is not, we're not going to do a half a percent, we're not in a position to do that. Um, a big part of the discussion last year was what do we have to increase to support Main Street and the pool? That, that is still a factor here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then to Jesse's point, new initiatives. I do want to call out, though, that in addition to funding constraints, we also just have 
capacity constraints for staff and for ourselves. And we should be really careful when we think mm -hmm. about entering into any new initiatives at this point. We have Main Street, Pool Operations, the Charter Commission, Lot 7D, um, the noise compatibility program that's coming out. There is a lot of work on the plates of staff. Mm -hmm. So in addition to providing that guidance on like, here's what's priority for funding, here's what we can you know, hold off on, I would think beyond funding too, to like what can we actually ask staff to achieve in the next year. Right. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to confirm where we are with the Main Street and pool funding. I think in last year's paperwork, it was estimated. So I think we did like 3.6 for this mm -hmm. fiscal year, and it was estimated to be Four, I think, is what we had planned, like in the modeling, the modeling that is not necessarily 100% accurate, <laughs> um, but that last year we had estimated a 4% increase needed just for the pool and Main Street funding this year. And you'll, yes, and you'll be getting a full presentation on that in November before, a month before you get any budget. So, and before we finalize our proposal to you. So as you see that, as you have that larger Main Street conversation, you can provide different guidance to us along the way then. Um, John is not in here, so can't speak immediately on the projections. So just to clarify, at a bare minimum, between the pool, Main Street, COLA, health insurance, we're looking at four and a half as a starting point. Is that correct? Yes, except that when we discuss Main Street, that 4% is based on some current financial modeling. It's based on the assumption mm -hmm. that we go through, I think, with the entire project and bond. It's also based on assumptions before the grants we've received in the last year. Excellent. So there are some pretty significant rev revenue offsets as well. Okay. Um, in addition, we got much better rates from the bond bank than we had yeah. modeled. So the costs mm -hmm. for what we've taken out so far are less. Great. I got a small scale question. Uh, back in 2016, when the pool closed, it was already in the budget for 2016. Did that money stay as a pool budget item, or did that we get reallocated to summer else? So it's currently uh, sitting in specialized supplies for the recreation programs budget within the general fund. It is a whopping sixteen thousand dollars. <laughs> um, <laughs> There wasn't really much of an operational budget for the pool, which is one of the reasons why we've run into the deferred maintenance issues that we've had. Um, wasn't it $50,000 though? And I originally, think but not all of that money was carried forward and kept built into the budget. Okay. Okay. So I, th I think unless you want to reallocate No, I'm just wondering because funding. I didn't know if that got, if it stayed as that budget item back then and if it could stay yeah. based on it. And I know it's a small scale to compare to the 4.6 or whatever mm -hmm. budget, but I want to make sure if it's that money's there, we should implement it back into the budget for the pool just to, I mean, hey, it's $16,000, it's $16,000. Does it seem safe to assume that 4% is base COLA, health insurance, pool, Main Street? Because I've gotten like three six or three something like between three and four percent, no matter what, we have to do that just to maintain existing services and do Main Street in the pool. I haven't seen modeling for the pool operations yet, so I can't mm -hmm. say with certainty what percentage it would be. That is the rough number that I, not a financial professional, was landing on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out what the room is. I would hate to say we want to be between three and four percent and say well, we need to be at four percent just to do what's already been committed exactly. to. So it'd be nice yeah. to know that that's our. Floor, maybe that would help this conversation as yeah. our floor is probably going to be mm -hmm. at least 4%, 3.5% with cuts, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. I, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I would encourage, I, I know I forced you into the tax rate conversation. I guess I would encourage you to think at a, at a um, because I am not prepared right now to talk specifically about the Main Street and pool numbers. Um, we have not updated that modeling yet in advance of the November mm -hmm. council meeting with the current revenue streams. So I guess I would encourage you to talk to provide us any feedback you have on what are the value statements. I, what I think I'm hearing you say from a high level is 
You want to move Main Street forward, but you don't know at what phasing yet. You want to operate the pool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing you say you're not super interested in staff reduction or operational reductions if you're if you're talking about a half of a percent to maintain current staffing. Um, those, do you see what I'm saying? Like, what are those high level goals that, you know, policy goals you have? And then let us bring you the numbers that fit into that. Certainly, I don't, I don't think we as a leadership team have any interest in um, a, a unpassable budget increase. <laughs> we would like to get a budget passed the first time. So then can we drop to question one, what is the council's tax rate goal? Let's save that for the end. So I think it, I think hearing you say you are okay with some tax rate increase is enough for us. In the past, we have had the experience of saying level fund the tax rate, which has very different implications for how we build the budget. Okay. Well, it doesn't if, seem like that's even a possibility. For we could do it. Well, <laughs> we, we can do it. I mean, we can but cut the budget. It's, yeah. So. yeah. It just usually yeah. means people. It would just yeah. be yeah. people and operational. And it seems like, if anything, we need to be adding positions to run the pool and operate some of these other things that we have going on. So I think from my perspective, hearing you say there is some commitment to a tax rate increase is enough for right for the amount of information we're giving you right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a very different conversation than we've had in past years. I think that we have, I mean, my personal feeling is we've made some commitments that we right. we have to. No, no one here is trying to back out no, of. No. <laughs> right. I think along those lines, when I was looking through the list of ads that you had marked out, the JAG funding is one where also council has made a past commitment that has a direct departmental impact. And between that and the CCPSA, which council has also opted to move forward with in the past, it seems like we. I would like to see something dedicated to making those two happen, like some combination of those happen. And maybe because we don't know the cost of CCPSA, becoming a reality and what it means for reforming the police department space and the window and everything. Um, I would love to see that there's some funding dedicated to making up the JAG funds or CCPSA or a bit of both. It's personal preference for mine. So I would say for some background, the messaging has been that when this authority is actually goes into operation that for the first year or two, municipalities would contribute exactly what they have in, in their current scenario, um, and that if there was a potential need for additional funding, we could do a one-time fund balance, because it would be one time we wouldn't be in a position to say this is an operational ongoing need yet. Would you agree so, with that? So I think those sentences are all right, but for the um, at administrative support that's going to stay locally. Um, so you're right, our contrib- in theory right now, although this could change in the next few months, our contribution to dispatch as it stands up is what we have previously funded dispatch at, just moving to a nor- new organization with one-time capital expenses, which is what you're suggesting. What that doesn't keep into consideration or take into consideration is with dispatch moving, there is going to remain with us some things that dispatchers currently do for us to administratively support the police department that we're going to have to find, to reallocate here among staff. So there may be that small administrative add. I think the timing here is important too. When does this change happen? If it is late in the year, I think we would still be in a position to do a fund balance and then consider the actual operations for the next fiscal year. So right now what the CCPSA board is considering is an August 1 flip over next year. So it's early in the fiscal year. Yeah. But that is for that is in discussion. I hope to know more before I present a budget to you. I would take the housing trust fund out of this discussion as a concern. There is money there to get going with. Um, there is $300,000 to start the fund with, there's not a need, I think, to worry about refilling that in the next fiscal year. I guess you, go ahead. I'm, I'm in support of programming that has a positive impact on our youth, because if we don't spend the money upstream, then we're going to spend it downstream with all kinds of issues. So I think that's an investment 
Sorry, are you talking about two different things? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, oh, okay. I said remove housing trust fund from the list, yeah. and then Hal is stating a new uh, value. Okay, sorry, Hal. Mm -hmm. So, invest in our youth. Families and youth. Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Sure. So one of the things, and Ray, feel free to jump in here, we've been talking a lot about is with the opening of the pool, orienting mm -hmm. programming to the pool, to the new community room, to Landry during the summer months, mm -hmm. especially with mm -hmm. North End taking off at the OCC, um, and really building off mm -hmm. what we learned this summer um, in the need to better provide mm -hmm. out of school time, pro like, um, structured programming right. for our young people is that yes is that kind of aligned with what you're thinking mm -hmm. or are you thinking something no else? Okay. just just continue support of that okay yeah i think i may have been one of the people that brought up the sidewalk improvements at the retreat that we had in the spring and i think that that is important but just given the scope of work that the staff have to take on with all the infrastructure projects i would be happy to put that off for now as a priority. I don't know how others feel. I also wonder if some of that can be handled through existing projects and CIP work. That, that's one of the main concerns of residents when you talk to them on the street. Jim and I just heard it again today. The women's the sidewalks, some of them are dangerous for older folks, not even older folks, anybody walking at night, it's dark early now. Um, walking your dog, people have rolled their ankles. There, the, some of the some of the sidewalks, like on Roger Street, I don't know if that's been fixed yet. Um, John, I don't know if you hit that up there. Some people were reaching out saying that the sidewalks up there are pretty in rough shape. Um, I don't know if we take that out because we have to have something in there for all residents, not just for a select group. And the sidewalks are mainly for every resident. I value the concern, mm -hmm. I would go back to the fact that we, my, on a, actually to get down to it, my personal value for the next fiscal year is that we continue with what we have committed ourselves to mm -hmm. and that we avoid adding new initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that some of these sidewalks are going to get addressed in existing work plans, but adding that as, you know, let's try to get a let's try to address a majority of these issues in the next year, I don't think is feasible from a staffing level, frankly, when we have Main Street, Watts M&D, Moose Compatibility, like that's a lot of the public work staff and zoning staff time. Can, we, can you remind me if we have a sidewalk prioritization, like level, uh, prioritization system right now? I forget if it's so discussed. Now we don't. What we have right now is we're updating sort of the, um, the current conditions for all the existing sidewalks. Um, from that, we'll go down to sort of a prioritization plan and go through the Public Works Commission. Okay. And that's not part of the anticipated work plan at this point? For this, for this upcoming, yes. It is part of that. It is. Okay. 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 So maybe it's just about communicating that work plan to people so that, yeah. you know, people know that it's going to happen at yeah. some point. And yeah. That, we're not just turning a blind eye to it. Right. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight, as we know. I mean, you can't be everywhere at once, but I think if people get the nod that it will have it done by the end of the month or next month it's on the agenda, I think that's good enough for people until it doesn't get done. And then, um, just like potholes, the same thing. I mean, that should be almost city maintenance. It's, it's for safety of people walking for pedestrians. and. I don't see the taxes go up a whole lot because we need to replace sidewalks, but I think what we have currently, maybe they can get tweaked or adjusted if they're just out of line. I know there's ways to do that. And, I mean, your, your staff is pretty good at what they do, so um, it's short-term fix. And so I guess I would just say that maybe if sidewalks are not something we're actually going to fund the reconstruction of in the next year, but as Lot 7D wraps up, as Moses Compatibility Program wraps up, we don't start the year, the next cycle with okay, what do we need to actually do for sidewalks if there is some funds that need to be allocated for doing the prioritization work and having a roadmap, a plan mm -hmm. for that we can look at in FY22, I think it would be great to not start to start there and not six months later. I don't know if that's the kind of middle ground, like 
kind of in the weeds, but um, some sort of a, l a little bit of resources towards scoping so that we are moving faster towards that um, and able to act more quickly when the time is right would be great. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, there's going to be times to address it anyways through other scopes. I like that. Um, I do feel like if we're going to put effort into scholarship funding that one, if we think about service reduction to offset, I almost wonder if it's in cost shifting in the fees. So considering mm -hmm. making our scholarships more widely available, but upping the fee structures so those who don't or won't apply for scholarships would pay a little bit more to help offset the cost of that funding. So I don't know if that's feasible with the fee structures and the, if that drives people away from the program as a result, but if there is some wiggle room to think about that, I think that'd be worth exploring in combination with the scholarship funding. I think that's also, like, this is a new program and we can use this as a learning year, so we don't dedicate funding to it yet, we figure out what that need is going to be in the future. Um, I, I feel similarly for the equity work, like we are in conversations about how this can play out, but we can use this as a learning year. You know, obviously, Jesse and Sean haven't even been able to meet yet. Me, Mark. <laughs> um, use this as a learning year, do mm -hmm. some of these incremental steps, and then be prepared in the next year to talk about what is an actual financial mm -hmm. need to operate these changes. And we'll still roll over our incentive fund. fund. Yeah. And that's not... In that's not in the level funded budget, right? Like if there was no increase, that would still be... Yes, the fund, that's yeah. built into the budget at this point. For five, five grand a year or yep. five grand total? Five grand a year. Okay. Yep. So in theory, there could be 10 grand next year to work with if we didn't do anything this year. Correct. Okay. Sorry, have we spent all of that? They would have to rededicate this year. Yeah, funding. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have not spent it this year. Do you have any broad idea of the cost to implement a new finance system? Um, yes. Um, I mean, so I think a broad... Um, I think there are a lot of moving pieces to this. And one of the things that I spent a lot of time at Town Fair talking with other people about was what, because so many communities use what we have now, NEMRIC, that if the state doesn't go with may go out of business. There, the state and the league are actually thinking about opportunities to um, power purchase other products that then we could get a state rate for at a lower rate. Right now to just buy an off the shelf Tyler Technologies or an off the shelf um, Munis or something like that, you're looking at probably I don't know, between twenty and $40,000 of annual subscription costs and probably $100,000 of transition one-time transition costs. Um, those are wild-ass guesses. I, will be, I mean, those are informed wild guesses. Um, right now, we pay for Nemric? Uh, less than $5,000 a year, including all disaster recovery and support. That's a great price. Why are they switching? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it will be essentially all new money. So my recommend, Nebrick will not go out of business in FY21 if they do. And who knows? The state may stay with them, and this is a non-issue. Um, my recommendation is that by the time we present the budget to you, we will know what the state has decided to do. And then at a minimum, we start building up that increase. So if we do need to change in 22 or 23, we have started to build up that capacity, built up some reserves for that one-time cost, and built up that tax rate capacity to fund the annual system. And I'm going to assume the state has not offered to provide any funding for municipalities to make a mandated change? Nope. All right. That's helpful. <laughs> What's the benefit for that system? So there are enormous benefits to a mo either a modernized NEMRIC or a new system. Um, NEMRIC is a homegrown, and Angela way in here, but as a basically a homegrown Vermont system, they do provide some services to a few other New England states. Um, it is very customized. Um, it is very hard to export the data to do any modeling with it. Angela is a wizard with it, so we are okay, but 
uh, it was a system that was built in the 90s. Um, so a modernized system is going to have far higher reporting abilities, far superior abilities to run different reports to look at how we're ex expending money or how revenue streams are coming in. It may provide the opportunity to look cross municipality at benchmarks. So how are we budgeting cross municipality? The benefit to the state and to municipalities of what the RFP as written by the state says is right now the education grand list um, that is set that we maintain locally but is managed by the state is all done via uploads. So they download a, a system to us, we upload the new values to them and it goes back and forth like this. There's no live, you can't log onto a screen and see the same screen. Um, so often what happens is they'll download something to us, say there's a mistake here, go find the mistake. We don't know where it is, um, as opposed to being able to like run a report that we can both look at and say, oh, this value is mismatched between, you know, 203 Weaver Street, my house, there's, it's in the municipal system at one thing, but the education mm. assessment says something else. And that's an odd example, but, but it, it doesn't allow any real time information sharing right now. On a statewide basis, when you're managing the education grand list statewide, um, that will have huge service improvements mm -hmm. to the tax department and the property taxpayers on a statewide basis. Winooski, it's actually, so one of the things the tax department said at town fair was um, Winooski's relatively basic, but for the TIF district, the TIF district mm -hmm. throws this all off again where it gets extraordinarily complicated to manage between the communities and the state is um, current use. Um, so property in the state that is actively being forested um, that may have an assessed value at the local level based on just what's on the ground, but then the property owner applies to put their property into current use because it's been being actively forested. That information is very, um, complicated to get from the state to the municipality and back. So that will be greatly improved statewide with the system. Doesn't impact us where you don't have any actively managed forests, right. but statewide it will have a, a huge impact. And the state did send out surveys to all communities who use the NEMRIC system asking about pinch points that we experience. And the one that we've responded with is um, support there's a very small group of people that do support when you do run into an error. Um, and I'm usually waiting for somebody to call me back and, uh, you know, That stops stuck. work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I think there's three staff. Um, there was until uh, we went to the cloud-based network system. Now there's really only one that can handle the major issues where we have work stoppage. So Angel, for example, experiences this where we run into some kind of glitch. We need Nemerk to update or restart or something, and she can't process payments at the counter because Nemerk's frozen. Um, not a great. I mean, it doesn't. It's not a ton of times, but it's frequently enough. It's not great yeah. customer service. Right. Okay. Thank you. Should we open to the public? Any comments? Chief, you're not allowed to mention new fire trucks. <laughs> <laughs> you're all set for now. <laughs> um, are there any other priorities, deep priorities, anyone wants to mention? Any other specific questions? Uh, no, this is, to me, this was very helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Excellent. Uh, let's move on to item G, potential Thank approval you. of a Global FM for Community Risk Reduction Grant. So just as a quick um, insert, not really inserting an agenda item, but we would like to introduce our new fire captain to you with this agenda item as well. And this is Liam Keating. Um, and I'll turn it over to the chief to give some of Liam's very exceptional background. Yeah, so the departure of Assistant Fire Marshal um, Courtney Brown, um, we went through the process of um, you know, putting out um, the effort to, to fill that position and to also have that position um, do fire. So the position is system fire marshal, um, fire captain. 
Um, it's a full-time position, um, really focused on the inspections and community risk reduction. Um, very competitive. Um, we're fortunate to have some great candidates. Um, Liam's from uh, Portland, Maine, um, has experience in emergency dispatching, um, inspections, firefighting, um, fire prevention. So um, we're extremely happy to uh, have him on board. He's in week four, so um, he's continued to come back. <laughs> I'm happy with that. And he's a great cook. He cooked us lunch on Friday, so he's looking pretty good. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm um, happy to be here. Like the chief said, um, I'm originally from New York, Long Island area. I moved up to Portland in 2015 to take a job full-time with Portland Regional Communication Center, dispatching full-time. Um, there, I was doing firefighting in New York. I started firefighting in uh, Maine. Well, took about three per diem jobs, and I was doing that, fire prevention, in uh, the town that I was living in before I applied for this job. And, I was fortunate enough to be um, considered and decided to accept and just so happens this is Vermont's Opportunity City and this was the opportunity for, of a lifetime for me. So <laughs> I'm happy to be here. That's excellent to hear. Thank yes, you. Thank you. How are you finding Winooski so far? Uh, it's, a, it's a very, um, it's a progressive city. It's growing and it's a really neat place to be and it's cool to be on the, the ground level of uh, so many changes. Awesome. Any questions for our new staff? Yes, welcome. Welcome. welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll spin right into the grant. So while at, um, with Chief Spittle, um, at the New England um, International Fire Chiefs Convention in Rhode Island, um, we were lucky enough to uh, sit through their um, educational seminars. And one of the presenters was FM Global. Um, FM Global runs a um, worldwide um, fire prevention grant program. I forwarded some information to you. Um, and the theme of the day for them was um, about prevention and um, the theme of the whole educational seminar was community risk reduction. So we felt pretty good to be there at the table and kind of um, be able to compare or better understand what we're doing and, and just how much we're on the forefront of community risk reduction and, and the efforts that we do every day and some of the other people are still just trying to figure out what what this is. Um, so I'm pretty happy to you know have the opportunity to, to lead that charge and um, to carry on your, your values and uh, turn that into community risk reduction. So with this grant, um, it's pretty straightforward. There's no match. Um, it's, they, um, I think it's four times a year they, they accept applications. Um, for us, we're trying to um, we trying to um, fill a gap that we we feel exists with those trying to um, resettle here for the first time or settle here for the first time, and those that are relocating to our community. And what I mean with that is um, a lot of people just don't understand the fundamentals of um, basic life safety, what a smoke detector is, um, cooking safety, fall prevention. Um, so the idea here is um, we had a very good experience with our recruitment video um, production, working with Channel 17 on a local, very local level, very um, grassroots effort, if you will, um, to really be able to, to carry our your values for Fort Winooski forward in that recruitment video. So the idea would be to do the same with this life safety fire prevention video that we could then use our external partners to help us carry that message. So the idea would be it's in a couple languages, um, you know, and we can maybe have a couple videos depending on cost. Um, one that we can use in some of our higher risk buildings, you know, the 83 Marlowe's, the, um, you know, just car yard. Yeah, you know, pieces, you know, um, some tools, and uh, so you know, put it in perspective why a, why a community risk reduction, um, you know. Right now we're at about 1,193 events for the fire department between emergency response and inspections. Um, you know, 900 of those, um, or 66% of that, is all inspection work. So about 33% of that's emergency response. Um, so I'm just trying to really paint a picture of the workload that we're doing here and that we continue to, to be on that forefront of community risk reduction and the fire prevention pieces of, of 
what's happening here every day in Winooski. Um, very important stuff. You know, on the emergency response side, you know, to date it's, so I'm talking January 1 to current, again, it's about 293 calls. Um, approximately 40% of those responses were in multifamily dwellings. So the, the same dwellings that we're talking about putting this video in um, and really trying to you know, educate people. Um, in seven of those properties, we responded more than three times. Um, in the top two of those seven, um, one property we responded so far 15 times and the other seven times. So again, you know, this data is really telling us where to, where to try to concentrate our efforts. Um, so more to come on the data. Again, this goes back to Firehouse. You guys have heard me talk about that a lot in the, you know, budgeting, um, where we're putting our resources, where you're trying to um, put future resources. Um, for me, is all going to be, not all, but um, we now have some very good data. We're starting to see some good data of, um, to be able to help us make those decisions. So this um, $6,500 grant is um, just a way for us to get further um, move our program forward. So. I think it's an exciting opportunity. Um, I was really excited to read about what your plan is for it and also to see, you know, no match. Yeah. <laughs> no, no strings attached. And to hear that it's going to be translated, the videos. Yeah. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we know it has to be right. I mean, it's, I mean that's, that's the main so you, this They give this out four times a year? Yeah, so once you're awarded it, you, you're done for three years. You're done for three years. Yep. Is there any opportunity to reach out to your partners that you want to team up with to maybe throw a couple bucks in to make that video service translated for everybody? Is that an opportunity that you see you could run and? Yes, I, I mean that's a great um, you know suggestion. Um, we're just we're trying to get the the seed money to get this yep. type of program off the ground. And then we would, um, you know, as this developed further, um, we certainly would be sitting down with our partners. Um, there's certainly some interest um, to work with us. We know that. Um, we've been asked, you know, I go back to, I believe when Ray was in the seat, we were, you know, there's people coming here saying, hey, can we get you guys to do a, do a video, um, you know, either through the school or, so again, this will be the seed money. Um, I haven't crossed all those bridges yet. Um, you know, I think applying for this with the concept in mind, mm -hmm. um, the goal in mind, um, and then we'll, we'll work forward. And certainly if we can get some other folks to, to contribute and make a better product that we can you know, have reach more people, I think we're all on board with that for sure. Any other questions from council? No. Any questions from the public? All right, I would entertain a motion to approve the Global FM for Community Risk Reduction Grant. So I'll move. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. It's um, nice meeting you. Yes. yes. Nice Thank you for coming. Stay, stay safe. Yes. Yeah. Apparently, we only hire redheaded fire. I was thinking <laughs> about that. Well, no, it might be the guy hiring them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ray will join us for item H, approval of Parks RFP contract. <laughs> He's not hiring all the redheads yet. <laughs> hello, hello. Again. Um, so, a couple items here in a row, but uh, first one is kind of a, a heads up and a request for authorization to, for a city manager to enter into a contract with Omnis, um, which is the group that we are recommending as the vendor for our parks planning, parks and open space planning process. Um, so that is funded through the National Rec and Parks Association grant that we secured last year. Um, that grant, 32,000 of that $40,000 grant was set aside um, through the application to cover the cost of this contract. And so we're um, requesting authorization for the city manager to enter into that contract um, with this group. We had five uh, bidders, really actually very competitive group. There was, I think, five firms that could have all done a really nice job for us. Um, 
so it was a hard decision. I definitely want to give some kudos to Eric, who is a great resource. He sat on the, the sort of decision-making group, uh, as did Alicia and Claudia from REC, and then Lauren Jacoti from Winnesby Valley Park District. So the five of us reviewed the five applications and ultimately felt like Omnis was the best fit for us. Um, so some really strong elements um, visually. They've got some really nice aesthetic to the work that they produce. Um, really strong use of infographics, which for us here in a multilingual community, I think is really valuable. Um, and some really innovative and interesting um, outreach techniques too. Uh, some things that we weren't seeing in other groups. I sort of jokingly said at the end, we did two follow-up conversations with our two uh, top groups. And I was actually pleased neither of them in either conversation said the word charrette once, um, which I took to be a really good sign. I think we're trying to, to really take this down to a level where everybody can engage and be part of the process. So, so yeah, we're recommending them and hoping, hoping you will enjoy what we put in front of you here. Yeah, so I, I think for the public point of view, this is a, an agreement to go through a public process to Correct. do some design for our open, open and park spaces. Yes. Um, I, the question I had is how does this work with our master plan. Yep. I think the master plan simply doesn't address those spaces. Yeah, and so within the master plan itself, there is a call for further development of parks and open space planning. So in the development of the master plan, and Eric, feel free to throw tomatoes or chime in if I'm way off, we didn't get into a lot of depth about land use as it relates to parks and open space. Um, I think there was a lot more look at um, the, the zoning code, the built environment, those sorts of things, and I think just for lack of bandwidth, frankly, we didn't get into a lot of depth around parks and open space planning. So this is an opportunity for us to do that and then layer that on top of the master plan that exists. Uh, so one thing actually both groups said, which was pretty cool, is that they had read through the master plan. Um, so I think there's a general awareness that this is not going to be a standalone item. This is going to be incorporated into a plan that exists. And I think both groups had some really positive um, things to say about the plan and what it says about the city. So that was encouraging as well. Right, and I can just add that I kind of felt the strategic plan called specifically for us to go into more detail for our open space planning. So it yep. was part of the master plan to take this next step. Correct, correct. Thank you. And just like the, the master plan was designed to be kind of an umbrella document for all the other planning efforts that we had done, so that allows us to update those smaller planning documents while the master plan is in effect. This is basically doing that, but adding it in. It's like the transportation plan. And exactly. Stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Any questions or concerns from the council? I would just call out, I liked, um, looked like they had a pretty like deep and broad data collection plan, including qualitative feedback in addition to quantitative. Um, that impressed me, I think, like having read the master plan. Um, I like the proposal here, so. Yeah, you feel good about it. Uh, if there are no questions from council, I would entertain a motion to approve the Parks RFP contract. So moved. Second. Motion by Amy, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. <coughs> now move us along to item I, uh, grant approval for a CSWD container application. From parks planning to trash cans. Um, <laughs> so we are seeking funds through the CSWD uh, container grant program to upgrade their receptacles at the O'Brien Center in particular. Um, the, we had a spot compliance check done through CSWD a number of weeks ago, and when uh, the staff member arrived on site, some of our trash cans and recycling bins were not side by side. Those are freestanding units. They tend to move about as things do down there, and so we have the correct number, but they're not built in such a way that they're bolted down and stationary. So this would allow us to get some upgraded units, I think improve the aesthetic down there, and also help us come into compliance with uh, the CSWD ordinance. So we are proposing an application to the container grant program and then would also be looking to use our community cleanup fund dollars as match because there's a one-to-one -one match requirement. So essentially there's a, a net zero impact to the dollars that we're putting out beyond what's coming out of CSWD's funding streams, if that makes sense, because that cleanup fund rejuvenates every year. We get $1,000 every year. 
So I think, um, like me, many other folks might not realize that there are Chittenden Solid Waste District ordinances that we need to abide by. Um, what is what is the penalty if we were not to comply? I will be honest, I did not look into that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I think at this point, the compliance checks that they're doing are really educational. It's not a gotcha effort. Um, you know, the, the woman that I met with was super helpful. She was the one who pointed out the resources available. So I think it's really, you know, as an agency, I think they're really committed to trying to improve the ways that waste gets into the waste stream and, and help support agencies to do that. So um, I don't know off the top of my head what those penalties are. I mean, more I think, curiosity. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> our representative Bryn to the CSWD would be very upset with us, especially <laughs> since they are also giving us the funding stream to right. make the improvement. Right. So we're essentially matching their grant with their money. Right. Right. That is exactly what we're doing. At their recommendation, yes. interestingly yes. enough, that was the staff person's suggestion. So um, questions okay. from council. It's really six thousand dollars for three. Containers. The the nicer sort of more stable side by side units are about fifteen hundred bucks a pop. I was amazed myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right, I would entertain a motion to approve the CSWD container application grant grant so application. Moved. Moved. Second. Second. Motion by Jim, <laughs> second by Amy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. And final item J, Community Services Scholarship Policy Update. So we are back to share some of the updates that we made um, coming out of the initial feedback that we got from you all. Um, so on the policy side of the equation, not a ton updated there in the language, um, primarily just removing the specific language that in the initial draft um, prevented city staff from applying. Um, and I believe that was Amy's recommendation. So we've made that adjustment. Um, a lot more work done on the procedural side. Um, and again, as noted here, even though those are procedures that would ultimately be approved by the city manager, we wanted to put those in front of you to contextualize the policy and kind of let you know behind the scenes what was happening um, on an implementation front. And then just kind of final contextual piece and then questions. Uh, wanting to make sure folks know that because this is a policy that will have a pretty broad impact we have a, a pretty robust outreach plan. Um, we're gonna use our current recreation software to do a blast out with the approved language, um, post that throughout our facilities and really make an effort to commit to connecting residents with this information so that as it goes into effect, um, folks know what's coming and we can kind of answer questions ahead of time. I'm, I'm excited to hear that there is a communications plan in place. And I also should thank Amy for the widget that helped me um, bring my language from grade 19 to grade 13. <laughs> um, I will say it took several iterations. Yeah, so it's tough. It was great, though. It was a really helpful tool um, and I think a good exercise for me to go through. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I wanted to bring that up, too. I think that's super important and something that we could consider not as a new initiative, but from time to time, having staff go through that exercise, maybe with one document, just to try to mm -hmm. make our documents more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any uh, coordination, I'm just looking at the outreach venues you have identified, I know the school's not part of it, the housing authority properties aren't part of it. Um, what can we do to help, not necessarily asking staff, but is there other opportunity to help extend that communication with the communications person in the school or other ways? Yeah, those are both great questions and suggestions. So I think the school we have a great rapport with and can very easily get that information out the door there. And um, I think with Housing Authority too, we do a lot of work with SASH. And mm -hmm. so I think that um, avenue is also a really easy one for us to plug into. So I will nope those both and add those to the list. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Are there any other questions or concerns? All right, so having addressed our previous ones, um, I would entertain a motion to approve the Community Services Scholarship Policy. So, second. Motion by Jim, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. That brings us to the end of our agenda. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 
Motion by Jim, second by Amy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.